Tell him, McCluskey. Tell him what time it is. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. All you people are so scared of me. Come quietly or there will be trouble. Man, that's just me. I'm Batman. This is Sparta! There is a tiger in the bathroom. I'm an excellent driver. If it bleeds, we can kill it. Pop quiz, hot shot. Keep the change, you filthy animal. You've seen her, haven't you? She was there this morning in the fire. <sighs> She's always there. You mustn't blame yourself. Blame myself? For what? For not listening to the others, for not staying away from the house. Hello and welcome to the first Monday Movie Show of 2015. I'm Andrew. Unfortunately, Stuart is not with me this evening because he's ill. Get well soon, Stuart. But in his place, I have helping us filling in for him is Nathan, otherwise known as Bouncy Beehole from We Are the Lollicost. How are you, Nathan? I'm I'm very good. It, it would be nice to be here under better circumstances. But you know, once a house drops on someone, it's dropped on someone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think Stuart will be very uh, sort of thankful for that. I'm told he is listening, so we may get some messages from him during the show on chat. Okay. Um, if anyone else is listening live, you can join in with him if he if he makes an appearance, or with us listening live in the bottom right hand corner. You have always always got your little chat icon on the speaker website, which you can join us. You can always check out things like our website, MondayMovieShow.co.uk. We'll keep you up to date with when we are going live and what we're covering on the show, including this week, which we're, we're covering what movies, Nathan? Uh, we've got The Theory of Everything, the biopic of Stephen Hawking. We've got Women in Black 2, Angel of Death from Hammer, and uh, possibly Michael Keaton's best film since Beetlejuice, Birdman, as well as DVD films, of The Rover, uh, Deliver Us From Evil, with the delightful Eric Banner, uh, Nurse 3D, Life of Crime, providing that Jeremy Farrell of another comedy vehicle, and then probably my favourite film of the year so far, Left Behind, <laughs> with Nicolas Cage. Yeah, a um, little bit, little bit of a sort of a, a hint to everyone. Maybe not his favourite movie of the year so far. <laughs> I think that's a fair, fair <laughs> assumption. Yes, I mean it does have the man in it, Nicolas Cage, of course. So. Um, but as usual, we'll have uh, start off with a bit of news in a moment. The UK box office top 10, go through the movies, and also the DVD and Blu-ray top 10. And obviously then now a round out of what we think are the best movie of the week to choose from, what we've reviewed. I'm um, going to go through as well in the box office to cover a few movies that were released during the holidays that we weren't able to cover. Um, but let's start off quickly with a piece of news I've got. Um, the other piece of news I have this week, um, apart from a bigger bit, which we'll go on to a little bit of discussion in a minute. Um, but the first piece of news I've got is, is from uh, Variety uh, website confirming that Scarlett Johansson has signed on to play the lead character in DreamWorks adaptation of the anime Ghost in the Shell. Mm. Any opinions on that? Well, I think since she's been Black Widow, um, people will see her as capable of doing it. Lucy as well kind of put her in that kind of techno-punk world a little bit. Um, I, I always worry a little bit when there's live action versions of anything to do with anime because it's generally not great. Kite that came out a few weeks ago wasn't very good at all. Um, but I think that's just because very often the, the material is quite treasured by a very niche group, whereas it's not like something that everybody would see. We're not doing a new Masters of Universe, although they are. But with that, you kind of, or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, for example, you're always going to get people who get annoyed about that because they have an opinion, whereas with anime stuff you're really only getting the, the opinion of people who genuinely love it in the first place rather than people who grew up with it I mean the Ghost in the Shell is one of those movies that pretty much everyone has either at least heard of it if not seen it and most mm -hmm. people have seen it especially mm -hmm. anyone who's into the sort of sci-fi thing I think it's kind of well typecasting obviously but I don't think it's the best casting they could have done I think they could have done with I don't, I don't want to say anyone in particular I can't think of anyone in particular but I just think it is lazy typecasting yeah, um, but, but then from a filmmaker's point of view, you want somebody sometimes to go into that role. You've either really got somebody who's perfect for the role and it doesn't even need to be a known actor or you get someone who is going to bring with them a certain amount of punch 
And you get that with Scarlett Anderson, for better or worse. You do get a certain fan base that will immediately jump on the film because she's in it. I mean, under the skin, how many people saw that because she was in it yeah. rather than the fact they wanted to see a Jonathan Glazer film? Mm-hmm. Um, also, the fact that, I mean, thinking back to Ghost in the Shell, it is one of those movies that's so influential. Mm. Things like The Matrix owes a great debt to it in some of the sequences, in particular yeah. the, the lobby shootout is highly influential yeah influence I, I, again you see we're speaking from the point of view of the people who would have seen this kind of thing yeah. i mean I, I would also say akira is as yes. influential but yet uh, in the last couple <laughs> of weeks i've been talking about a lot the amount of people who haven't actually seen it they're, they're aware of it they know what it is they've seen the dvd but they've never actually watched the film itself because sometimes i think it is one of those things that's kind of a a gateway and someone said to me have you seen and they were listing off a whole run of anime that's on netflix at the moment and i was thinking i haven't i haven't seen this i know what they are but i haven't sat down and watched them so that is something i'm going to be doing through 2015 is catching up on some of the good anime i've missed um particularly the attack on titan stuff which i keep getting told is very very good and i just haven't ever found the time so hopefully if this does well it could also be a shot in the arm for the kind of uptake of the, the original stuff and the um oh the, the spin-off thing i can't remember what it's called now uh blah, blah, blah. no it's, it's gone the but they did the whole the enders thing was it no there was a, a follow-up series thing that came in two boxes and I've, i own them but i can't remember what they're called <laughs> so <laughs> you know what it's like andrew you yeah. buy stuff and it goes yes. on a shelf <laughs> <laughs> and never gets washed for about but yeah if it months. gets people buying it and, and getting into it again then and it could be a good thing either way so you know if it gets a big name to pull people into a really cool original version then i'm all for it you should point out to anyone who is listening who doesn't know you that you do work and run a video rental shop or DVD mm. rental shop. So you yeah. have sort of the ear of customers that way, I guess, <laughs> sort of a lot more. Yeah, um, it's, it's interesting because obviously having worked for Blockbusters for so many years and having somebody at the top tell us what popular films are popular and then you start running your own shop and you realise that actually the very popular films aren't very popular. They're just given a lot of money and a lot of advertising and you're given 100 copies to put on the shelf and then people go, oh, there's 100 copies of that film on that shelf. That must be a really good film. And uh, it's been a joy, actually, when you can pick what stock you put on your own shelf and you can just choose a film. And it doesn't even have to be out this week. I can choose a film from eight years ago and put it in my new release wall <laughs> and just go, <laughs> it's new to the shop this week. It's not new out, but we haven't had it before. Here's a film I'd like you to see. And uh, it's There's good. I, I can manipulation pick. at work there. Well, no. It's, do you know what? How many times have you seen a film because somebody's recommended it to you? True. And the thing is, how many shops do you go in where they do that, where it's not something that's been corporately funded? Like there's supplier funding is a bane of the existence of shops because you walk in and you're seeing a layout of a shop that's dictated by the studios and what prominence they want for each product on the shelf. And we don't do that. We just say, we well, want to see a cool film there's a cool film for you and uh, it's a, a real blessing to be able to do it and i'm very grateful for the opportunity so um on to the other big piece of news and this is a really big one obviously that we've not covered it because we've ended just before christmas just before it all sort of kicked off really <laughs> the whole thing of the interview mm. um if, for anyone who has been living under a rock or maybe in north korea now that their internet's been cut off um What's happened is the whole thing of that Sony uh, Pictures was hacked. A whole load of their computer system was in, as it was um, informa- in, infiltrated. A lot of emails and everything have re- have been released and so far and so forth because of that. Um, but including where some films were released and leaked screens of, of things, um, all um, d- denied and not necessarily confirmed, but suspected to be a hacking either by or on behalf of North Korea. Um, who have then sort of you know come out as saying oh it, is, it was a righteous hack um, because of the fact <laughs> that um, it was about it's a studio that was going to release a film which had the whole thing about um, I forget is it Kim Kim Jong Un Kim which one was he's the Kim Jong Un Kim Jong Un yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. who um, is sort of the, the movie features him being portrayed by an actor um, and is a sort of a, a comedy by Seth Rogen and um, James Franco as mm. um, journalists that go over there to assassinate him. I mean, to be fair, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I would also be unhappy 
if I found out that my life story was being told in a film with Seth Rogen and James Franco. <laughs> I'm not entirely, I can't really blame North Korea for being a little bit antsy about it because they, they never really threatened to start World War Three over Team America. They weren't happy about it, but they certainly didn't go was, to this level of effort. That was his father. Maybe his father has. A, Maybe his father had a better sense of humour. Yeah. <laughs> he was right. He was, just so, a he was so lonely. He he uh, he obviously followed Brian Connolly's advice, where he was like, "That's just a puppet." Someone sent him a video. <laughs> You know, that first game. And listen, you're going to see Whoa. some crazy images, but just remember, it's just string puppets. That's all it is. Whereas yeah. this one, obviously, they do have quite a good look alike, and obviously, it doesn't go very well for said yeah. dictator. Well, not dictator, uh, honourable leader. Let's be fair to the guy. We don't know. We just know what we're being told by the Western media. Uh, he might be a very lovely young man. I doubt it. I mean, it's you know it was in the bond i mean the bond film die another day that started in north korea and that was grim they had married diamonds <laughs> in their face uh frankly that's uh i see enough of that in hamster uh just feeling my age now after you bring back brian connolly and the, it's a puppet gag <laughs> yeah, i like really the fact that some people listening they'll be like <laughs> <laughs> other what? people will be like <laughs> what <laughs> that's how you divide an audience yeah perfect <laughs> Uh, let's go on to the uh, UK box office top 10 which we have the latest one but it's not actually due to be updated properly till Wednesday so there are some things that will possibly not be on there but should be but the latest version we've got let's go through that okay all right so at number 10 we've got PK which uh, I'm reliably yeah. told is the most successful Bollywood movie of all time yeah we haven't seen this we the Monday movie show doesn't see Bollywood films because generally we can't get to see them where we are um and mm. if we could i don't know that i would because it's it's unless it was a special one i don't think because it's a i just f personally don't find them i've seen one before and yeah i honestly sat there for two hours watching a film and at the end of it i was kind of shaking my head going i don't know what i just watched mm. it is it is a very interesting kind of cultural thing to go for because obviously it is i mean yeah. it's a massive movie industry i mean it's not something where you can kind of laugh at because it's it but it's a complete world away much yeah. like anything else in india you know and it's a big and, cultural difference to the, the style yeah, of the films well. exactly i mean it's why I, think, I mean it's it's like the whole japanese thing of, of anime as well some things don't translate i think a lot of things no. from bollywood don't translate to western exactly world. yeah i mean i've um i'm actually after reading the the kind of the blurb on PK. I, I am my interest has been peaked uh, because it's well, it's about apparently about an alien and uh, who comes to earth. So it could be like the Bollywood version of Paul with Simon there Pegg, was, which there was could another, be great. There was one I cannot remember the name of it, but it was released sometime in last year, around about August, I think. There was a Bollywood film which was a superhero one, and it looked pretty good. I saw the trailer and I thought mm. it looks pretty good. Yeah. didn't get a chance to see it because it was on yeah. nowhere near me see, this is the other thing like i i have netflix and you know how netflix will recommend you certain things mm -hmm. not just films but it'll then call it with categories and it'll say because you watch this here's some like hard-edged comedy or whatever all the time it gives me bollywood like every three <laughs> options is a series of bollywood films to the point that i've now watched three and now it's giving me almost every other thing um but yeah, I, I, I don't mind it. It, it. I mean, it is weird. I do generally watch them drunk. But I can see why people like it, because it's certainly jolly. I yeah. mean, if you, if you think, um, I'd like to see Mike Lee try and do a Bollywood film. I don't think he can do it. I'll put that out there. It's a challenge, yeah. Mike. I don't think Carry it'll on. Happen. I don't think it'll happen. <laughs> no. Um, I'll move on. At number nine, uh, Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1. Um, I don't know if you've seen this because I, I know you don't get to see many cinema releases. Um, I've seen this as, and I think it's the weakest of the three Hunger Games films. I mean, it is only half a film because it was mm. part one and it's been split into two parts. It's it's a shame because I mean it has something there. It just doesn't capitalise on it because it's um, following Katniss, Katniss Everdeen um, after the first two Hunger Games, which are very, very similar and have the, sort of the whole thing of the games. This then becomes a, a whole lot more political thing. And I'm hearing people saying, you know, they're really liking it. I didn't mind it, but I just found that it kind of had this whole thing about the way that the press manipulates things and how that works. And it, that was kind of where it was going, but it didn't really capitalise. It. it didn't really... It, it was felt like such a missed opportunity. Mm. It could have done so much more with that. It could have really said something about the press and the way that they do manipulate yeah. you know, the news and things. So I mean, they it, touched it on it in mm. Catching Fire, 
And yeah. I did think all the, this has got potential to be very exciting. And obviously, sad past the Philip Seymour Hoffman. I didn't know how much of an impact that would have. I haven't seen the film. But from what I'd heard, it, it didn't seem to impact it greatly in terms of it still being able to carry on the story well. But it is, it seems to be getting really good kind of, not critical reviews necessarily, but getting positive reviews. But yet at the same time, people are sort of saying, well, it, but it's not a, a whole piece, yeah. so you can't judge it as a whole. And I think, well, it was released as a separate entity. So it is going to be judged as a separate entity. To sit there and say, well, I can't really be too down on it because it's not finished yet. Well, that's really, I mean, it's the age of all, well, not the age of all, the Infinity Saga, where they do that as two parts. Mm. Nobody's going to watch the first one and go, hmm, it wasn't great, <laughs> but I'm sure the next one will be brilliant. So let's be fine. It'll either be good or it'll be bad. And well, I think, this... you know, it's, there's a, something to be said for just being straight with a release as a release because that's what it is. I do think, though, that this is definitely going to go either up or down. It's not going to stay the same opinion of it when part two comes out because no. then it's going to be seen as a whole and that's going to affect it. And I think, I hope that it will be better for it. I hope that it won't be worse because the thing is, it's, I mean, it feels like it's half a film. It doesn't feel like a whole film. It's the shortest of the, of the, of the, the films by quite a bit, by about 25 mm -hmm. minutes, um, shorter than both the other films. And that's normally as films go on I'm not saying I was expecting to be like that but it generally is a trend that as films go on they get longer or about the yeah. same running time and, which and it says to me they just didn't have enough makes, to it, it certainly out. rises yeah I mean it, it rises a certain amount of cynicism when you think well this is the last in a trilogy let's get as much money as possible yeah. by spreading it over two releases uh, I mean Harry Potter did it didn't they they did it with Breaking Dawn it seems to be always oh, based on a popular series of books we want to make sure as much of the last book is in this couple of films or whatever, let's do it. But then it gets to a point where you think, well, actually, now they've set a precedent that, f that filmmakers are now l using that model. And I don't think, from everything I've read about Mockingjay, is that they needed to split it. It wasn't a huge, great, big tome of a book. I mean, the last Harry Potter book is a fairly hefty tome, <laughs> but the last Hunger Games book is not very big at all. So, um, I mean, they've not done what they did with The Hobbit, managed to make three films out of it but still regardless it is we'll get to that later i think mm, yes um but yeah uh, next up lovely lovely bit of animation uh penguins of madagascar which is um, which should be terrible well it should be but the thing is there's a, there's a funny thing that happened with the madagascar films first one was very um, average and to do you know it did well on that mm. on that grounds but it was nothing in sort of level with the competition of things Shrek and such that came out at the same time. Two was better, but again, nothing outstanding. Three was it got good for, I mean, us. I remember when Ian Stewart reviewed it, we both really, really liked it and were surprised by how much oh, we I liked love it. it. And yeah. The, yeah, and recently saw it again on television over Christmas, it was on, and sat there and watched the whole thing and loved it. Um, and then saw Penguins of Madagascar, thought, okay, let's see what this is going to be like, and got to say, really really pleased with it enjoyed it loved it lots of gags in there from the very start right to the very end and mm. hugely entertaining not as brilliant as it could be but definitely way up there and a lot better it's it's getting to that kind of um you know pixar level not the, not necessarily the animation but of the humor and the characters and the and the fun yeah we had of it which is really really i think cool. that's it i mean you know that's when you've got four wacky penguins <laughs> the film almost writes itself. You just have to come up with a good scenario. And if I'm right, this is the one with the evil octopus, isn't it? Yes, voiced yeah. by um, John... Oh, I'm forgetting name, brilliant. John Wayne. Let's just say that. <laughs> yeah, let's say John Wayne. Um, and it's also got Benedict Pumpkin Patch in there as well. Yeah. Uh, who can't I always... pronounce penguins. No, penguins. They, penguins. I saw that on uh, my... Um, partner claire pointed that out to me when he was on the graham norton show <laughs> and uh i did i did think that's a brilliant bit of casting in this film quite a lot of times yeah yeah which is <laughs> which is good so yeah uh number seven we've got unbroken which um is a movie that was released during the holidays so we didn't review it properly i'm going to quickly go through it now um it is the movie directed by angelina jolie so sort of um premier direction um of film um and it's a true story of a world war ii um veteran uh, who, who survives a plane crash um he's actually a olympian um louis zamperini 
um, who um, sort of after spending so many over a month at sea, sort of stranded in a raft, he finds himself then in a, a Japanese uh, prisoner of war camp. And it's uh, it is actually a, an amazing performance from Jack O'Connell, who is great after seeing him in Start Up and Seventy One and this now. He's really, really sort of getting the attention he deserves. I think because he's doing mm. he does a fantastic job in it. It's a good film. It's just, a, unfortunately, a little bit too long. It needs a little bit of trimming. Um, and I think that it's... I mean, it shows that it's not someone who's an experienced director, but it does show that Angelina Jolie does have what is needed behind the camera to make it work. Because mm. it does work. It's a, it's a perfectly good film. It's just it's... A, a veteran director would have made certain changes and done different things and I think made it a better film. But that's not saying yeah. it's a bad film. No, no, definitely. I really look at the early works of Spielberg. The idea was there. Yeah. You, know, you can see a spark of something, but it wasn't until later on when then with the budget and with a good cinematographer and with a really good editor that the films then really came together to be the magic that we now know. Uh, I mean, if you look at Jewel or Sugarland Express, they're very rough around the edges, you know, but it's still an un- unrecon- un. un- and, oh crikey loving live broadcasts yeah. it's still undeniably Spielberg I'm trying to yeah. say you're, you're, so, you're not normally used to doing live you're normally doing you're, well you're I used, normally used to do live podcasts now <laughs> I've been spoiled with pre-record and uh, now I'm back in this way I have- I have to say thanks to my other half, Cat. She has reminded me in chat that it's John Malkovich. I couldn't think of his surname. Oh, uh, yeah. Of all the names to think. That's right, because he does look a bit like the octopus. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's penguins in Madagascar there for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, number six, Dumb and Dumber 2. Yeah, the, the further adventures of Harry and Lloyd. Um, <laughs> again, this is one didn't see during, well, it was during the holiday, so we weren't able to review it then. I'm going to just say, very quickly, really disappointing. It is it's kind of more the same but it's more spoofing of the same it's it's not it doesn't seem to be you know as fresh i mean it doesn't seem anything in it original or new it's got some giggles in it but nothing that got a big laugh in it and it should mm. have done a lot better it should have been a lot funnier it should have been less gross out in a couple of moments there's a, there's a couple of moments that kind of did make me squirm which is yeah. not pleasant for a comedy um and it's just sign of these comedy films being funny but not being funny and using gross out and it doesn't go too far but it's like no. you literally get to the, get to the point and you go well that was a good hour and 45 minutes to waste what else could I have done and you come up with a list yeah. you find yourself coming up with a list of things that's you know quite a bit longer than what you could do instead of that yeah I do worry that were it not a Dumb and Dumber sequel a certain amount of people are going just for a pure nostalgia because the original was a very very funny film yeah. But it was funny oh, yeah, based that's... on the fact that it was almost like, what if Mr. Bean had a housemate and they went on a road trip? And that's pretty much the setup for it. And yeah. I, I did worry when they said they were doing a sit. Well, obviously, they did the prequel, <laughs> didn't they? Dumb and Dumberer, uh, which had nothing really to do with the actors. Um, but obviously, with it being a sequel, and you think, well, oh, I really like that film. I, I'd quite like to see more of that. And of course, time has passed. It's been, yeah. what, 20 years since the last one? Something like that um, at like 94 that. 95 wasn't it it's, so it's basically the same setup it is just a road trip thing that they something happens yeah. they, find and it's out, like, they find out that one of them has got a, a now um teen daughter and so they go traveling across <laughs> country to find and meet her um, see, and i as you find can imagine, that the most unbelievable aspect of it to be honest <laughs> yeah as you can imagine the hilarity ensues or does yeah it? Well, that's it. And that's the problem. There's too much of a build-up. I mean, even the Mr. Bean movies couldn't live up to how funny the series was. Okay, I'll, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of like step back from it a bit there and go, this is not as bad as the Bean movie. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's all right. just harsh. We'll, we'll, we'll give it that badge of honour. They can put that on their posters. Yeah. Dumb and but, Dumber 2, not the, as bad as Farrelly's, Bean. It is the Farrelly's directing again, and the Farrelly's definitely can do better. Mm. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think it's just, I say, I think it's just, it's a very kind of, because it relies too much on nostalgia, the type of movie made now. If they made something about Mary now, it would be an entirely different film to this oh, about yeah. Mary then. And I think that's the problem. Sometimes when you pick something up and then drop it into a more contemporary era, it just doesn't work. And sometimes that's a shame. I mean, it's, I always like it when they can make a, a good kind of sequel but as much as i love the blues brothers blues Brothers 2000 was awful <laughs> just <laughs> awful i mean blues brothers isn't a great film 
but at least there's something about it that's quite magical with the second one it's just like oh yeah okay brilliant poor old Don Cheadle uh, number five <laughs> Night at the Museum Secret of the Tomb yeah the third movie of this series um, hopefully the final one but I don't mean that in a bad way because the thing is i got to say I, I like the first two films and I like this one it's, it is just more of the same, but they do manage to introduce some new characters by changing it to be set in London, so they have a new museum, they have new characters. You have a great performance by um, Dan, um, I'm sure my other half will remind me because she loves him from The Guest. Um, I can't think what his surname is again, but he's a British actor who's, who seems to have been in everything recently, and he's absolutely brilliant as um, as Lancelot. Um, and it's fun. It's it's the typical same kind of humour. There's things in it. And I saw this actually on the same day that I saw um, Dumb and Dumber Two, and I enjoyed this more and laughed at this more. And I have to even admit, at one point, almost brought a tear to my eye. Uh, so does because I haven't had a chance to see this one yet. Does the shadow of Robin Williams hang over the film, or is it a really good kind of send off for him as a final it, film to be released properly? It doesn't, but there is one scene where something happens and you kind of, it's like, oh, that's a little bit on the nose, sort of, mm. for him, his character of all of them. Um, yeah. But no, it's, it is kind of like a nice, it's nice to see him going out on a film that he's able to be funny and because uh, there, there were some straight to video releases that came out with him recently yeah like the angriest man in brooklyn which was terrible it was um, awful and, <laughs> and this is the you know that kind of thing that robin williams it's a nice final film unlike mm. someone like raul julia being in street fighter yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just the I, I watched. Uh, there was a video that came kind of when the film started coming out. There was a prom proposal video with the lad that's in the film, and then it had Ben Stiller and Robin Williams helping him ask someone to prom. And uh, it's the lad who plays Ben Stiller's son in the film was doing the asking. And as I was watching it, I kept looking at Robin Williams, and I just couldn't look at him without thinking, "God, in a few months' time, that's going to happen." And in the film, obviously, because I haven't seen it, obviously he's a performer. Whereas in this, and he's just standing there idly for a second, thinking of what to say next. You could just almost, and it, I don't know whether it's because you know how it's going to end up, but you then start to look for almost a crack in the smile a little bit and think, oh, that's, that's pretty sad. So I am glad that he's gone out on this. I had a big discussion when he died about um, what films I would want him to be remembered for. Because a lot of people were saying, oh, I'm going to watch Hook again, or I'm going to watch Mrs. Doubtfire again. And the first thing I watched was World's Greatest Dad and then One Hour Photo. Because I thought he was actually a really, seen, really solid actor. Still never I, seen One Hour Photo yet. So You should. You really should. And Insomnia as well. I mean, he managed yes. to hold his own against Al yeah. Pacino. <laughs> He's very, I mean, it's, very sinister in that film. Yeah, but he, it, and it was a really solid performance because sometimes it's creepy when a childhood kind of favourite actor goes dark. And that can be quite upset. It can work really well because you look at it and go, oh, it's a bit odd. But with that, it was just a really good performance. And um, Good Morning Vietnam, for all the kind of the funny bits you'll remember, is a very serious film. And Williams was remarkable in it. So... I kind of, in a way, I like the fact that his final cinematic release it will be a family movie. But then sometimes I just wish he had something that, at the same time or coming out around the same time, that showed off his his acting chops better than yeah. Happy Frigging Christmas or whatever it was called when it came over here. But um, yeah. yeah, it's a shame. Well, it's a shame. It's Dan but... Stevens, I can think of it was as well. The the actor in it as well. And also, I should mention as well has a has a great cameo from a. Um, let's say X-Men character, X-Men actor, um, that is genuinely one of the funniest things I've seen. Good. Good. <laughs> so look out for that, boys and girls. Yeah. Uh, number four, we've got the new updated version of Annie. Yeah. Um, Stuart has seen this, so he would have been commenting on this, but I haven't seen this, haven't had a chance to see it. And um, I'm kind of curious, but I do have one of these sort of nostalgic opinions of the original Annie from when I was growing up because it was always on television and always seen mm. it a lot and it's one of those films that if you're in your 30s um, as I am um, <laughs> um, then it, you probably saw it quite a lot growing up and it is a classic film it's like Bugsy Malone it's one of those kind of things it's, yeah. and I don't like musicals but I like the original Annie I'll yeah. probably enjoy this but I have suspicions from what everything I'm hearing I won't love it 
No, I think uh, Jeff you know, for me because I've I mean I've got a ten year old daughter and she's absolutely she adores it and she hadn't seen the original so for her this was her Annie if you know what I mean like everybody has their favourite Doctor Who or their favourite Bond I'm not saying the Annie movies are going to enter the cultural mind escape as much as Bond does but you've got this basically a, a film that's made for this generation of kid basically or this generation of family and I think I, I like it when that happens really. Um, and so, you know, it could be worse. She could just have really liked Footloose remake. Um, but she didn't. She preferred Kevin Bacon. So I was very <laughs> pleased with her about that. I showed her both side by side. Not side by side. That'd be mad. Yeah. But one after another as a double bill with some popcorn in the middle and a bit of a walk around. Showed Which her the one new one. New one first. Ooh. Well, you know, because the thing is, that's the one that's made for her. That's the one okay. that's made for the people her age and then i was interested to see whether she'd be interested in seeing the one not made for her age you know but it had kevin bacon in it and uh she preferred the kevin bacon one, which did surprise me so you know hopefully she'll enjoy annie and then maybe she'll want to watch the other one not annie too though that was awful that should never have been made uh number three we've got paddington which is honestly one of the most brilliant kids films i've ever seen that I absolutely loved it fantastic performance by uh ben wheatley no ben i'm losing names completely here <laughs> um but the the voice of paddington is absolutely brilliant he's fantastic and the, everyone else is great in it even sort of scenery chewing uh nicole kidman in it um and it's a fun film it is a pg but it has got a couple of <gasps> moments that kids will possibly young kids when i saw it there was a, a young kid that really started to freak out at one point thinking oh no 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 sort of thing and then you you just heard his parents going, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right, you know, and a couple of minutes later, yeah, he was happy, you yeah. know. And you should exactly. get that. In, in kids' films, you should always have that threat. If you think how horrible some Disney films are in yeah. what they're seeing, and that's what kids need. That's why kids are rioting on the streets, because we need more films like Paddington. We need more genuine <laughs> threat. And I, I mean, I loved Paddington. I had no idea I was going to love it. I had every reason to hate it with a passion. But how dare they? How dare they take Paddington? They should be cardboard cut-out people. Why have they got real people in there? <laughs> Make it a cartoon, by all means. But live action was with bet what? Because it's it's too unrealistic in my mind. And then you watch it and you just forget that, and you just love the film and you you enter into it's the just, world of Paddington. It, it is. It's just so openly welcoming to the audience. Yes, yeah. it's a delight. Mm. That's the word I'd use. A it delight, is. and I don't say that very often about it anything apart from an angel delight but only the butterscotch um ben wishaw was that who it was because yes. he's the new q isn't he in bond yes, the new q yeah and, um also was in one of my favorite films last year cloud atlas ah uh, yes yeah well so was a lot of people yeah so was jim broadbent he could have played he could have been in paddington he as paddington been. he'd have been a good paddington but he'd have played it very differently uh number two moving from fictional bears to a totally factually accurate film exodus gods and kings yeah um sorry i'm just trying not to crack up after that um yeah i mean it's ridley scott doing the big overblown what ridley scott has now become sort of famous for doing and the thing is it's very very sort of feels like it's put together from bits and pieces from his other stuff it literally feels like it was written with russell crowe in mind who just was too busy or something and wasn't able to do it so of course they got someone else in instead um and it's honestly felt like it was it wasn't a bad film it was very long too long two and a half hours long but the thing is that it honestly all the way through it i'm thinking you know oh this is this bit's from gladiator this bit's from um you know something else he's done and then ends up with a big big wave and everything going oh I, I've seen this in White Squall um, so <laughs> it was a whole thing of it's, it's kind of like a nostalgia trip down memory lane for Ridley Scott oh, I think you, and see this is nice being on a movie podcast with someone who sees a big wave and the first one they think of is White Squall well, no, not just, not just, just a people. perfect storm or anything no, like that I mean no, but I'm thinking of like Ridley Scott films because White Squall yeah. is Ridley Scott. So. Yeah, yeah. But um, I'm saying most people just go, oh, a film with a wave in it. Um, <laughs> I don't know. What about The Impossible, mate? No. No, that wasn't really a wave, was it? Well, it was kind of a wave. Uh, I've, um, I'm looking forward to seeing Exodus. Not because I expect it to be very good, but I do like it when people make 
films based on kind of biblical events mm. that try and do it with quite a serious tone. Uh, I enjoyed Noah for all the wrong reasons, <laughs> and uh, I expect to enjoy this for exactly the same. Just watch it, just think, oh, that's ridiculous. So I ridiculous. I wonder but... if that's the reason why Russell Crowe wasn't cast. If it's pretty, you know, having playing Noah and Moses would be a bit. That would be too much. much. <laughs> he'd probably get confused and just play noses, and he'd just make a split the Dead Sea and float a car through it or something, and that'd be mad. So it's best he didn't, frankly. I mean, um, the thing is, the thing is, it's not terrible, and it's not. And I'm someone again. I'm like you, who I'm not a religious person, but hmm. I get. I like. I think religion makes a good subject for films. Oh, it really does. It, it does, really does. But, but the thing is, I mean, he did this already with kind of, uh, and to a lesser extent, with Kingdom of Heaven, which mm. uh, if there is the, the horrible, horrible theatrical version, which you and I have talked about before, yeah. obviously, I'm sure. Um, but the director's cut is absolutely, uh, it is a masterpiece film, brilliant film. Um, mm. But this kind of retreads part of that and then goes big all out, sort of gladiator style, big effects and everything as the movie goes on. And... I mean, I didn't hate it. I just really found myself going, oh, this is a Ridley Scott film. You know why? Because I can see that. Because I can see that. Because, you know, just finding myself being distracted by the, all the the Ridley Scottisms. Yeah. Which, you know, at least it's nice for a director to have a stamp. I think that is important. Mm. But it would be nice if there's a bit of variety from time to time. Yes. Um, but, yeah. Uh, finally, the number one, blah, 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 blah. There's, there's probably some music playing in the background in my head. Uh, the Hobbit. Battle of the Five Armies. And I got the yeah. name right. Yes. <laughs> Not the Five Marches, as you were saying before the show. March of the um, Five Armies, yeah. Or the last yeah. of the five sequels, yeah. or anything else it could be. <laughs> um, and the thing is, I mean, it's, it is... I've only seen it once. I do want to see it again, because I want to see... I, I did, like... I did, like, enjoy it. I did enjoy it. But mm. I have reservations of it. I do feel that it is very over the overblown... It does literally get to a point where you, you possibly wonder as Peter Jackson just got bored and done this to finish it off. And um, I didn't hate it, but it is my least favourite of the Hobbit films. And the view is basically with me and a lot of people I've heard is I like The Hobbit, I love Lord of the Rings. Yeah. It's not in the same league. It's See, good, but it's not in the same league. question I would ask is if The Hobbit trilogy had come first, firstly, would it have been a trilogy? And secondly, would you have been excited for Lord of the Rings? Probably not. No. And that's that's why, because a lot of people, I think, the, what they enjoy most about The Hobbit is being back in Middle-earth. It's why it people is, yeah. saw Terminator Salvation. It's not because they wanted to see Terminator Salvation. They just wanted another Terminator film. They wanted to it, just try and get something of what they got from Terminator 2. And, um, and I think with The Hobbit, that's kind of almost the, the overindulgence of it is why we've ended up with three films. It's why all the kind of extended stuff and extra bits were pulled in to try and make it all kind of sit within the canon of the Jackson Lord of the Rings trilogy. And I just, that I find not appalling, but I find it quite offensive that they haven't just sat down and actually said, what does this film need? They've said, what do the audience want? And the two should never really sit together. It should be, let's make the film that's the best possible Hobbit film we can make based on this really good book and not say, wow, they want to see loads of stuff. They're quite used to sitting for three and a half hours of film. Let's give them that. No, let's not give them that. Let's make one three and a half hour long film. I mean, the first Hobbit was great once they left the Shire. It was then pretty much for the last... <laughs> last hour or so really good really well paced bit with a musical number that didn't need to be there and then you kind of you move on and every time it's the same there's like a whole hour of film where you think that could just have got chopped down uh, just removed and then make one long film and i know there's this whole thing of let's make a film an hour and a half to two hours long because it fits well on a cinema show board but you could make the hobbit six hours long show it three times a day and you'd pack it out mm. that is a problem with so many screenings being on that they're never still out it's always a half empty cinema um, but that is and the UK box office top 10 though um, with surprise, mm. surprise or not surprising number one it's been there now for uh, four weeks three weeks four weeks I yeah, think. yeah. Um, so I guess we'll see whether or not it does survive with these new releases that are coming out with uh, I'll go on to the next one I'll go on to the first one which is uh, Theory of Everything mm. or The Theory of Everything 
Um, it's directed by James Marsh. It is the the true story, the, the sort of biopic following the life of the, the sort of uh, a physicist Stephen Hawking, um, who, as we are introduced to him as a, a young man played by Eddie Redmayne. He's at um, university. He is sort of going through his thesis and working out what he's doing. Um, at the same time, he then meets Jane, who um, will eventually, this isn't sort of spoiling anything, but will eventually become his wife. Um, and it is the, the story sort of as they how they meet and then eventually leads to the whole thing of him learning that he, he does have um, a degenerative motor neuron disease, which is going to leave him unable to um, do anything sort of for himself, unable to even speak after a certain point. Um, at one point it does come to a point where he is then um, sort of wheelchair bound in a chair that he's sort of able to move with a uh, you know electric chair um, and they set up a machine to be able to talk for him as he can no longer speak here's a clip so how does it work it uses a very simple interface that scans through the alphabet and selects each letter one at a time I mean using this technique the professor can expect to write about four words per minute good Better than one a minute. <laughs> yes, and w what I've done is taken the components from a, a telephone answering system, actually, to convert the written text into synthesised speech. I mean, the voice sounds a, a little bit robotic, but um, should we give it a try? Great. Here's the clicker. Right hand. There you go. Welcome to the future. My name is Stephen Hawking. It's American. Is that a problem? So, here's the thing with the theory of everything. It is a book. It is based on the book which is written by Jane Hawking. It's not based on any books written by Stephen Hawking because all the books he's written have been about physics and um, his, you know, mathematic things to do with that. Hers has been about the story about her life with him and their life together until um, you know, sort of present day and such. And it is a quite powerful, very well done. Um, film but it does all hang on this performance by Eddie Redmayne and the thing is that he does a fantastic performance he he is really really good in it there are some scenes in it which are quite sort of powerful in uh, when he starts having problems being able to walk and it's, obviously you have a progression from initially he has sort of little moments where he trips or things like that and then that's going on but it, it never takes centre stage at any point even towards the end of the film where he is just sort of um, chair bound and not able to talk um, and there's things that basically but it's, it's always focusing on this relationship between the two of them and that's what's nice about it it, it focuses on the, the people not on the events um, it really does sort of focus on the two of them um, Felicity Jones plays Jane Hawking in it and the two of their performances are they're, they're actors that I, I've seen Eddie Redmayne in um, things like Les Mis um, hmm. he's in the Les Mis films um, I don't think I've seen him in anything that I can think of to name I probably have seen him in the small role it was or something for. very good in My Week with Marilyn if you ever yes, saw that yes, he was he very was, very good in that it was a very small role though wasn't it I don't remember being he was, he was the guy who was it him yeah, yeah he was there. the intern guy yeah um, but yeah I do remember that being good but um, it, the thing is with this it, it does centre on the performance and the performance is worthwhile and holding up and I'm glad to see I mean it's it's again someone else being nominated in things I, I'm glad to see him getting recognition because mm. it is a great performance and it is um, well directed well put together it's uh, not an overly long film even though it is two hours it doesn't hang around it doesn't at no point feels like it's dragging and there's some other great performances in there as well. David Thulis pops up as one of his lecturers, who then becomes one of his friends. Um, Emily Watson pops up as well as um, Jane's mother, but is really kind of wasted a bit. She's not in it that much and doesn't get to that much. There's a couple of scenes, uh, one in particular that sort of stands out a bit, but it's it's a very much a thankless role. But it is a it is a film that's worth seeing. It is a film you will come out at the end kind of feeling. It's one of these ones that's you know. You it, you come out at the end, and it's not necessarily the best uh, result for the characters, but you come out feeling inspired and sort of you know it was a, a successful film, and it's a it's a successful story. Hmm. Yeah, 
I think it happens that you get these films every now and then where it's a biopic of something where you know the inevitability of it. You know, you know, know what you're going to go in to see. It's like when I watched Senna for the first time. And yeah. it's through the whole film, you've got this very excitable man who's very passionate about something. But you know what's going to happen. You know where this is all going to. You know all the time that kind of feeling of helplessness as a viewer that you, you're seeing something that's just horrific. In, in many ways and obviously I'm not saying that Stephen Hawking's condition is horrific but I think that's as close as you can get without sort of suggesting that in, in any way really his disability has impacted his brilliance and his achievement I mean many of us would even hope to get close to what he's managed mm. while persevering but yeah. I always I, I do find these films can be incredibly kind of illuminating when you sit there and you think oh you don't you don't want to have to witness some things but the fact is they're there and this has happened this is not a story this is a man and uh i'm, I'm glad the film's going to go i'm looking forward to seeing it and like i say everything i've heard about it it's it's one that could have been almost like the king's speech where it just kind of almost by numbers could be a great movie yeah but uh this one does seem like the the performance is hold up to the expectation that you would put upon it as you go into the theater it is. I mean, it, and it's a thing that the, it does sort of have parallels with um, the imitation game. Mm. Um, and but as I say, this is more about the character, the, the person. As much as the imitation game does have a lot of focus on the person, on um, Turing. Turing, yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. It's this has more focus on that and less focus on events and things, whereas yeah. Imitation Game obviously did focus on things like Enigma and that mm. to a degree as well. So that I mean, it's, this does really show how Eddie Redmayne is a great actor who, I have to admit, I probably overlooked in the past as well, but I won't anymore. No. And I think that's it. Every actor... I mean, as you are saying with Jack O'Connell, if you watch him in Skins... I mean, Skins has been a brilliant melting pot for British talent. Um, but if I watched him in that, and I, you kind of think, you think, there's a good actor there. Uh, when I saw him in 71, breathtakingly good. Just it's so good. Starred up, was really good. And um, you just know now, if you see his name on a movie... Because he could have just become another Danny Dyer. He could have just been in that kind <laughs> of movie. And, and I'm not saying Daddy Dye's typecast, but, you know. And uh, he could have just done that. He could have just been the laddish kind of lout who did this kind of movie. And starred up, I did worry that was what it was going to be when he was in it. I thought, oh, I know exactly what to expect. It didn't. It, it, it astonished me how good his performance was in actually what was a really good film in itself. And uh, like I said, I, I like this. When you see a young actor hit his stride so early on and you think, could he be the next Michael Caine or could he be... Yeah, you know, the next Sean Connery or whatever. Will we see this at after thirty years time? Because if that's him now, what happens when he's had ten, twenty years to fine tune his craft? And uh, it's very exciting. Yeah, very much true. So, uh, on to your cinema release: uh, Woman in Black, Angel of Death. Yeah, or Woman in Black Two, the Angel <laughs> of Death, which is the first Hammer sequel to ever have a number in the title. It's the most interesting thing about the film. That's that's the sad fact. Uh, I. Woman in Black 1 is not a great film. It is held back by the fact they wanted to go for the 12A rating. And whenever you try and do a horror film with a 12A rating, you're always going to have some sort of issue with what you can or can't show. And it's creepy. It's a creepy tone film. And, and were it not for the fact that it had Harry Potter in it, uh, it pro I probably would have enjoyed it more. But I just couldn't take Daniel Radcliffe seriously in the film at all. And it just felt too restrained. But that said, it did do a kind of... It was very creepy, and it had some good jump scares, and it had some visual imagery that, for the rating, surprised me. And the last time a film with that rating genuinely creeped me out was The Haunting with Owen Wilson and yeah, Lily. Yeah, the film. Um, yeah, yeah. It was, it was it, when Owen Wilson's character gets decapitated in a fireplace. And I was thinking, oh, this is a 12 like you can't do that in a 12 you see the head fly off and everything but then of course you've got things like Jurassic Park and it, you can be quite and even the Hunger Games to a point you can be mm. quite kind of grim in tone but without being too much so with Women in Black 2 I thought well I like the storyline I like the setting Eon Marsh House is a very creepy location you could pretty much put the Chuckle Brothers in there and it'd still be the most terrifying thing you've ever seen since the Chuckle Brothers um, but 
as we were saying about Dumb and Dumber, what's happened is we're living in an age since The Conjuring. And... Hello. Oh, okay. We have... Now have issues with Skype. Thank you very much. Skype oh dear. Is... Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm back. back. Okay. Where did, back, yeah. where did where did you get to before Skype decided to play um, a monkey? You were starting to say, I can't. It's something about that you've now got past the goriness, and then sort of you have the whole thing of that, and then now you have this, and that's as far as you got, I think. <laughs> All right. So so, and I mentioned the conjuring at this yes. point. Yeah. So yeah. So we're now living in a post conjuring era, and so you know what you need to do is you need to kind of not better it but you've got to learn from the lessons of the last great film that's why i always think if you're doing a film in a genre you have to look at where the genre has got to and then make your version and you can be different you can be a traditional horror which is what the world in black 2 tries to be but it just feels too restrained and it basically looks like some the filmmakers were watching qvc and there was a special offer on jump scares and if you bought one jump scare you got all the jump scares for free and then they just threw them all into the film. Because the only jump you'll have is from a cat or a piece of instrument playing sharply or a tin falling over or suddenly somebody standing there. And it's, it's very cheap. And I don't want that. And I've seen the Babadook recently. And the Babadook managed to make jump scares creepy by genuinely being scary, not just making me jump. And I kind of felt myself angry <laughs> the woman in black too that it wasn't better let's let's hear i've got a clip here we're going to play which has actually got i think one of the jumps in it so well it, you can't play you a can't, clip without one see, yeah no you can't see it but oh we'll play it and you can so you just we can hear it okay yeah see if you can imagine it who's there let me out And whoever by one thing certain, a child shall die. Tell me how to stop. It's too late. We tried. She killed all my friends. Now I'm the last. Come back, please. We'll leave then. We'll leave then. <laughs> So that's the kind of uh, that clip kind of does say it all with the loud bang at the end. Yeah, I mean, thing. It, the thing is, I mean, obviously, I've not really talked about the story. It's set about forty years after the original film. A group of children are being taken out of World War Two London um, and evacuees, and for some reason, the British government has decided that a haunted house in the middle of some marshes is the safest location to keep a load of children. Fair enough. <laughs> Maybe that's a good idea. Most of them went to stately homes, which were occupied, not a big old empty mansion. Uh, it is a good setting. World War II is always a really good set. A war in general is a good setting for horror. You know, Devil's Backbone was better for being set during the, the Spanish Civil War. Um, this one has a really good tone. There is a sense of dread. You do feel... There's one particular child that sort of seems to be pulled towards the kind of the, the spectre of the house a little bit. Um, and all the way through, what I wanted it to be was be the orphanage, be the Britain's orphanage. And it had such potential to do it. Um, and it's, it's a, a competently made film. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I, I sound like I'm being quite negative about it. Um, but it is competently made film. The director, Tom Harper, he did the scouting book for boys with Thomas Turgish about five years ago, which was a brilliant film. And he's, he's got a knack, but it seems that the film's in spite of, I suppose, driven from a, a book that was specifically written with the film in mind. So the two are kind of blind leading the blind. And so they've not really made the film based on a really good book. They've written a bad book to inspire and, and justify a film. Um, if you like the first one, you'll like the second one. The Old Marsh House is a great setting and The Woman in Black is a good character, but it just doesn't feel enough, in my mind, um, to justify being a Hammer Horror movie, which is what it should be. So, so it is a case of diminishing returns for the sequel, as usual. Yeah, I mean, it's the last sequel I think they did was uh, a sequel to Frankenstein, um, and uh, it, it was just they kind of they did 
the Dracula films always kind of did a spin-off. They did a new take on the story. They had, whether it was the daughter of or the son of or something else. And it's, it's just with this one, it seems to be, let's just basically retread the same old boards that we've done before um, in this time where people really go mad over ghost movies. All we need really is a Haunted House 3 to parody the Woman in Black movies and then hopefully <laughs> oh, please, they'll stop no, them making any more. Please. Please, well, no. it's it's a bad parody movie kills off a bad series of films, and that's what I'd like to happen now. I, I call upon the Wines Brothers to just make another haunted house movie, please. Oh, I, I won't see it. Do anything, thank you. No. <laughs> I'll invoke the evil upon us. Clatty brother Nick too. No, thank you. Um, no. Uh, no. Uh, so uh, I'll go on to the last cinema release we're covering this week, which is Birdman. Uh, it's written and directed by Alejandro Gonzalez Inaratu which sounds like the kind of thing I was just saying just now. Um, it is a, a drama fun to, f- focusing around the, the character of uh, Reagan, played by Michael Keaton, who plays a sort of a washed-up actor who is mostly famously known for playing a superhero character as uh, known as the Birdman um, in a previous series of films. He's no longer doing that. He has now been years gone by since doing that and not really having sort of much of a career has now moved his way to Broadway and has set up and paid for and financing his own performance and an own play that he's written based on a novel um, and things are sort of not necessarily going to plan all the time things are going on with you have um, an actor who is um, sort of there at the start who is very overacting and he is there kind of thinking oh well this isn't good and he then imagines something will happen which turns out actually did happen and the the actor is no longer able to play the part uh, so what they end up doing is sort of figuring out what they're going to do he's there talking with his manager Jake played by Zach Galifianakis um, and the two of them having to decide what they're going to do now as things look like they're all going to fall apart here's a clip we don't have an actor uh-huh. and if we cancel the first preview the press is going to smell blood and we can't afford to lose any more money at all okay what do you think I should do well we hire an understudy let's use the understudy no Reagan, listen to me, please, for the love of God, listen, our perfect dream actor is not going to knock on that door and go, hey, fellas, when do I start, you know? Can I talk to you for a second? Yeah, what's up? Did you find another actor? No. Yeah. Okay, well, Mike's available. He is? Mm-hmm. Mike who? I thought he was doing the thing. He was, he quit, or got fired. Mike who? Which is it, quit or fired? Well, with the Mike, it's usually both. Mike f***ing who? Shiner. Yes! Jake. Oh my gosh, how do you know Mike Shiner? We share a vagina. I think you'd want to do it. Mm-hmm. How do you know? Because he told me he wanted to do it. Jake, yes. Jake, yes. Ask me if he sells tickets. Fine. Does he sell tickets? He sells a load of tickets. Okay. Now ask me if the theater critics love him. The theater critics love him. They want to on him. Hey, Leslie. Right on his face. Everything for a reason, right? You think he'd come in this evening? I'll call him and find out. I'll call his agent. Amazing, amazing. So... Here's the thing with Birdman. You've got this cast, which is made up of Michael Keaton, as we said. Emma Stone is there playing his daughter. You have Naomi Watts, as you heard in that clip, playing uh, one of the actresses on the, in, the, in the play. Andrea Riseborough plays uh, another actress in the play who's also got a relationship with Michael Keaton's character. Um, and then you have also Edward Norton, who turns up. And then, as we heard in that clip as well, Zach Galifianakis. And the thing is, the cast are perfect. There is nothing wrong with them. They're all fantastically brilliant. They're all really good. Them, I would actually say, out of all of them, the one that surprised me the most was Andrea Riseborough because she's completely different than anything I've seen her in before. Um, and the thing that's really good is it's great to see this great cast, including Michael Keaton, all giving brilliant performances. And the thing is, it is a film that is more drama than comedy, but it has comedy moments in it. The thing is, it's a really gutsy movie to make, and it really, really is trying to be... It's a brave, bold movie because... It's not all done in one take, but it is filmed in such a way you can, if you're looking and you know sort of the tricks of how they do it, you can see where there have been cuts made. But it is literally like it's one take. The camera moves, mm. it goes through, it doesn't cut to another scene. There's, there's no cutting angles even in the same scene. It's all in one one sort of choreographed thing. And it is honestly, for that, it's a really visually interesting thing to see, as well as having not only characters that are interesting, dialogue that's good. It, it really does have everything there. It's just, it's honestly sat through it. I loved it. Just the problem I have with it is that it 
felt long as it went on because it kind of has this thing. It's it's just under two hours, and the problem is, as it gets on, you kind of go in. Okay, so is that it about to end? And then it doesn't, and you go. Okay, is that it about to end? And it doesn't, and you think, okay, is it going to end now? And that's a problem for me. I think uh, it's kind of and. To going back to Lord of the Rings, it has it doesn't have loads of endings, but it has points at which you're going. Well, that could have been an ending. It's mm. not an ending, but you can see how it's like it's kind of like they don't the the director doesn't want to let go of it, and I think that is a problem. Aside from that, though, fantastic film, great performances, funny, brilliantly performance performances in it, and some emotional scenes in it as well. And it all centers say around performance again, but there is not everyone is note perfect it's not a bad performance in the house that's excellent as we're re- just reading a bit about the uh the making of the film they shot the entire film in a month and they were filming 15 pages of dialogue at a time which yeah. is uh, almost unheard of i mean anybody that knows anything about film production that's a huge amount of stuff to do in one yeah. case, which fits in with what you're saying about the, the elongate it seems and how it's kind of very carefully put together it was it was put together with a, a very ballsy and very kind of confident director but for what you're saying obviously he just doesn't seem to have known when to end it which i think does tend to happen uh when you've kind of got something and you're you're so invested in it mm-hmm. sometimes you can kind of overindulge towards the end and i think that's happened in many films for it will happen in many films since you know but uh for me as we said sort of during our little clip i'm just really pleased to see michael keaton in a role where he's not just voicing an animated character again because um mm. he's a very fine actor and uh it's it's this really good, does good to see him a in. chance to show it as well he, he yeah is absolutely fantastic and, he, and obviously he's the main character in the film and he's he deserves to be he's fantastic in it he's really yeah. really good he's yeah absolutely phenomenal and screen holding excellent well, that's it for the cinema section of the show. We're going to take a quick break, after which we'll come back and do this week's DVD and Blu-ray section. Stick around. From, from page, page to screen. Page to screen. Cast. So they have, nine times out of ten, they have to send it back to you unopened or just throw it in the garbage can? Things don't always look exactly as we envision our life to look. But sometimes it works out and turns out even better. Gregor Fisher, his bacon number is two because he was uh, appeared with January Jones in Love Actually and January Jones and Kevin Bacon appeared in X-Men First Class together. I've got to say, the very Harold and Kumar 3D Christmas now, that just makes me <laughs> want to rush out. It's about the acting, about the writing. That's really what theatre is for me. Probably had more names than uh, than Prince or whatever. <laughs> Never mind, there's a joke for the oldies. Um, oh, everybody's like, who's Prince? Who's he? I'd just like to see uh, Mr. Freeze hiring his bad guys going, right, okay, so you're a psycho, right, can you ice skate? Head over to iTunes, Spreaker and Stitcher and put in the search box from page to screen. And we're back with this week's DVD and Blu-ray section, during which we're going to have a look at these new releases. Uh, we've got The Rover uh, with Guy Pearce, but Deliver Us From Evil, Eric Banner, Nurse 3D, uh, Life of Crime, and Left Behind. Yeah, and also we're going to have a quick mention about a film, because, as I said, um, you are filling in for Stuart this week. Anyone who's not mm. listened to the cinema section, just come through to the DVD and Blu-ray. You're filling in for Stuart, who is ill at the moment. Get well soon, Stuart. Yeah. Um, and people who don't know you, you are from your sort of a friend that I know anyway as well, but we know from also We Are The Lollicost. Or yes. The Lollicost. Yeah. Um, and you also run a video shop as well, so obviously you have a lot of access to people and films that are out on video and DVD. Well, DVD yeah, right now, isn't it? So, which is which is a very changeable world the last year, because obviously before I was working for Blockbusters, and that was a seven hundred store chain, you know, internationally, but just in the UK, seven hundred and fifty-two stores, I think it was, uh, are now all gone. So. For a lot of the companies producing rental DVDs, where are they selling to? Because suddenly, your biggest buyer's gone. So now, if we want to stock a title, we've got to order three months in advance, so they then produce to demand. Hmm. Well, we've now got a, we've got a guess <laughs> how well a film's going to do. I mean, sometimes three months is long enough because it's had a, a launch and it's done well or not at cinema. But sometimes three months is the window from launch to release. And so you've got to kind of 
really judge it quite well and say, well, we think that film's going to do really well or we don't know about this film and sometimes we'll trip up. But it is interesting. Like um, with Prisoners, which is a phenomenal film, uh, probably one of my favourite thriller releases of last year on home, kind of home media, but we were only allowed one copy on DVD and one copy on Blu-ray because they, I think they only made 600 for the whole country um, that we could use to rent. So it's, it's an interesting it's- challenge. It's interesting as well because that did hang around in the box office top ten, the DVD top ten for quite a while in the top five movies, I think. Yeah, and it and I think that may have been why it was restricted a little bit because it's um, I think for prisoners it did all right at the cinema, but it really came to home on DVD. It was one of those ones that once people started talking about it, they wanted to see it. It kind of had what I class the Shawshank would, um, effect, where you get a film that deserved better at the box office than it got, and then it gets it on dvd and prison is one of those sort of films that i don't know anybody who's absolutely hated it i find it very difficult just to find people who are a bit kind of mm. about it they yeah. generally they, they like it or they love it and uh when you're renting to people obviously people come in and go can you recommend a good thriller and you go well, well prisoners is quite good i've been doing that for a year <laughs> just because <laughs> there, there aren't well, that many have, great thrillers You'll be able to change it up soon with uh, Gone Girl then, which had a similar sort of effect in the box office. Yes, and I think that's going to have a very interesting DVD release. We've, we've kind of speculated quite well on this one as to how many we get in. Um, but weirdly, the second most popular thriller of the year last year was The Call with Halle Berry, um, mm, which I wouldn't have pegged because it's not something I'd heard of before the release. And it- just did really really well at, at, on rental which is odd i mean as you sometimes as people listen at home won't know but andrew and it sounds as if skype is playing up again yay we have problems with skype see if we're hopefully back are you back i'm almost back, You're back. yeah i'm back, You're back. Uh, <laughs> yeah so i was talking about basically i send you top five renting movies don't i sometimes uh, you, have, you have done and it. and you you generally like you get a bit disappointed with the renting yeah. public for some yeah, i mean well, super I, super shark was, has rented people, nine times yeah, uh, blue people jasmine just seem to get people i don't know where people get first of all these films come out and you never see anything about them no but then they go into the top 10 you're like well how are people finding out about these films people like me that's why andrew <laughs> people like me i put them on a shelf and i point at them um no it's weird i think with dvds uh what we found is like blue jasmine for example really yeah. great performance from kate blanchett really really good film for woody allen um we've had it in store since i think it came out about march last year on home movie and uh it's rented three times across all DVD and Blu-ray just three times in, in wow. total uh, Mrs. Brown's Boys the movie which we'll get to in a bit <laughs> uh, has already rented a hundred times oh, so God. it's like the thing is what I like to believe what I tell myself to sleep at night is people who love film buy them people who don't care rent them and <laughs> they don't care enough to want to watch a Woody Allen film they just want to watch Danny Dyer snarling at a camera or a giant rubber shark eating someone. Um, that's fine. I will provide that for them. That's, there will be a copy actually. of Blue Jasmine there. That's a question, actually. Are there any films with Danny Dyer taking on sharks? Uh, if not, there will be soon, because I'm about to write that down and pitch it to him. <laughs> and I dare say he'll probably go for it. Uh, but like this week, he's had, um, or last week, he had a little one called Bloodshot. And uh, it's slightly different to... Uh, to what you would normally expect from him. And my colleague, he writes a little blurb about what's coming out this week. And he didn't even look. He just saw Danny Dyer film. Guns, gangsters and girls. The usual Danny Dyer. I had to change it. Actually, that's not what this one's about. Um, we need to put in as a little bit of a plot. Danny because it's, it, it's so, we're so used to it. I know. And it's, do you know what? <laughs> Worst thing is, it's not a bad film either. Say that oh, quietly. Well, things, do, things do change then. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let's crack on then. Let's go into yeah. the uh, before we do the, get into these new films. Let's do the DVD and Blu-ray top ten. Okay. Uh, starting at number ten with the Hobbit: The Desolation of Smaug or Smaug or Smog or. Well, I say uh, Smaug, and Smaug. because I own a shop, I'll tell them what it is. But according to um, according to Peter Jackson, it is supposed to be Smaug, but should that not be S H M A U G, not S M A? Or is that just him having a slightly disabled mouth? we just don't know do we <laughs> peter jackson is not english 
<laughs> so he can't really tell us how to say words, can he? But he's not American, so he kind of half can. Doesn't count. It doesn't <laughs> count. Um, Desolate Mouth has rented very well. Uh, since last film we've had, it has jumped up in kind of popularity again, because obviously people do, they want to see it again. Uh, and we're selling a lot. And also the extended edition has helped, because yes. I think they combine the, the sales of the two. So that obviously came out in about November, I think it was. Um, and that sold very well and and as it should because that's the one that people who love the lord of the rings souls they should have waited for that one yeah i I actually did that i have the two hobbit extended versions i don't have the theatrical versions i I didn't bother them because the thing is as well that's good with the extended ones they do come with extra discs there's there's literally five hours of extra stuff as if the films weren't long enough themselves yeah um with the extended stuff but five hours of behind the scenes stuff which is the kind of stuff i really love and these are really really in-depth good look mm. at that kind of thing oh, and, and, and i like the fact that they've designed them to match the lord of the rings ones yes it does carry on the numbers as well from the yeah. lord of the rings series which is good and i like that and like i said I'll, i have lots of issues with the hobbit trilogy i have no issue with the releases of the extended versions because they are exactly what i want yeah. um so yeah that's that's all good and it's going well uh, number nine is uh something we don't really cover but it's a comedy dvd with lee evans monsters live yeah, which no is is our is our top seller actually in the store, which yeah. obviously it should be because it's in top ten. Yeah. But uh, to be honest, I didn't think my local customers would have gone for Lee Evans as much as they might have gone for, I don't know, some reheated Michael McIntyre. But um, yeah. yeah, it's obviously it's his swan song tour. He has now said he's retired from stand up, so I guess maybe that's helped push sales a little bit as well. But he, he puts on a good show up until he plays his piano at the end. He can leave that. He's not going to do it anymore, so he didn't need the advice. But frankly, that's not what anybody in the history of any Lee Evans gig has bought a ticket and gone, thank you for the hour and a half of frenetic comedy. What, I've really been waiting for yours, you to sit down and sing a song behind a piano. And then he does it, and one single person stands up in the O2 just as an applause. No, that needs to stop right now. Don't any other comedians think to do it either. Awful. Okay, let's talking of awful. Let's go on to the next few films we've got. Number eight, Let's Be Cops. That's not awful. I love Let's Be Cops. It's the buddy oh, cop why? movie that isn't about cops that I've always wanted. <laughs> Think about it. It's about a guy who works in games, which is kind of my big interest, and then a lovable loser, me. Right? Two versions of me starring alongside each other. Well, I talk to myself all the one time. Of, one of which is a Wayne's well son. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's also got Jake Johnson, who is, in my mind, the finest comedy actor since Jim Carrey. Drinking Buddies. Really? I adore Drinking Buddies. Mm. I thought his performance that was great. That wasn't really a com- comedic performance. I thought it was so good. I really love Safety Not-, Safety Not Guaranteed as well. He does an understated performance. This isn't really understated. I felt quite sorry for him in the film. I liked the characters in the film. I thought it was silly and over top, but it felt like an 80s buddy cop movie. And I missed those. And this is the nearest thing I've got to it. This and the heat. The last year, oh. that's been the two closest things, and the both of them. The heat was atrocious, though. The heat was just horrible. Yeah, do you know what? How much I hate that film. And yet, I quite liked it. So yeah. that's the thing. See, I want something different from film that you do, Andrew. That's that's the problem. <laughs> uh, but let's be cops. Is uh, it, it's done well to get into the chart? I think because it's it didn't. I don't think it made much of a dent at the box office and uh it's it's done well to sell i think maybe off the back of new girl i think that might have just been the mm. the primary it's definitely not the wines brother <laughs> uh number out. seven then what do you think of sex tape well now i can't be too crude because this is going out live but this is i will give you the exact blurb i give to customers when they ask me in the shop okay much like any other celebrity sex tape ultimately disappointing <laughs> That's really, really quite... It sums it up very accurately, yep, doesn't quite, it? It could have been better. I think very, Jason very, yeah. Segal perfectly cast Cameron Diaz as total atrocious miscasting. Shouldn't have been her at all. Should have been someone, I don't know, 1998, Renny Zellweger would have been perfect in this. And but, the Rob Lowe appearance as well. Don't forget that. Mm, <laughs> well, rather, see, let's forget that. Oh, yeah. Well, I really like him in Parks and Recreation. Uh, he did like five se- or four seasons of that and he was really good in that I didn't like it to start with because it was like it was Rob Lowe and the only funny thing he's ever done in my mind was be the young version number two in Austin Powers but um, he has potential to but this whole film was just very lazily put together not funny at all 
and uh yeah it's, it's just another in a long stream of people where they made a film they're con- so convinced that everything on screen is hilarious and it's just not it takes more than that to make people laugh and uh, number six mrs brown's boys <laughs> the movie and sex so tape go, is by far from, a triumph from in comparison <laughs> Mrs. Brown's Boys the movie, and I'm sure that both no, no, of no, no, it's not the movie. Elf and Stewart have discussed movie. at times. Uh, the movie, <laughs> the movie, um, the is movie. It's as the far movie. as I'm concerned. If any film that I've ever seen in my life deserves just to be taken out to the English Channel and hoofed into the sea and never be seen again, it's this one. Now, I have a very well, simple rule. I have no. A- I have a, you know a challenge to make to that. Go on, then. Keith Lemon, the film. I preferred it to Mrs. Brown's <laughs> As bad as it is, Keith Lemon, the movie, I expected Keith Lemon, the movie, right? <laughs> because it is exactly what that character is. It's atrocious, it's brass, you know, it's awful cameos. You know what you were going to get and exactly what was on the end result. It's what we all deserved for wanting the film in the first place. Mrs. Brown's boy is the movie could have been all right. Because the series, while I don't find it very funny, has got a very good audience. With the film, they've done that age-old thing of taking what works for 25 minutes and then making less than 25 minutes of it work in a feature-length movie. It's arrogant. It's, frankly, quite racist at times. Uh, It's not funny. The cast need to be paid some acting lessons with the amount of money that they're making from the series and the film. And... In, I watched. I didn't just watch the film, Andrew. When this came out, I watched the film and I watched all of the extra features because I hated it so much. I wanted to know why. I wanted to see the interview with Brendan O'Carroll and see at any point he showed some remorse. And he says in an interview on it, "We recognise a cash cow, and this most certainly is." And I just thought, "You said that on the DVD." <laughs> I mean, we all thought it, but don't say so. <laughs> Oh, it's it's just awful. Uh, uh, the worst of it is, and I'm not. It's not a spoiler, right? But at the end of the film, it's in all the trailers. She's basically up in court on two main charges. Now, one of them is proven to be not true, but then, remarkably, the charge of benefit fraud, which frankly, in my mind, was far more serious, just let go, and then they have a dance routine. Now, frankly, <laughs> that's a very dangerous attitude to show people, because some people will think. Well, it's all right to commit benefit fraud because Mrs. Brown did it and they all just danced outside a courtroom in Dublin. Well, (laughs) lovely. That's very nice. But it's a film. Chinese people don't all talk like that. Um, If you've not seen the film, basically Brenda Carroll plays a Chinese man. I say a Chinese man. It's an Irish man attempting to do a Chinese accent. On the making of, they explain they had Burt Kwok to play that role, but he was too ill to do the film. I think he got his mum to call in and just (laughs) say that because he probably read the script. But um, I'd have just scrapped the character there. Now, that character's getting a spin-off movie. Oh. And there's going to be an animated TV series. And another series of Mrs. Brown. And a spin-off with Rory. Just or uh, awful. It needs to be stopped. It's worse than Ebola. There should be news stories about this. We're never going to have to worry about Ebola in the UK. We've got Mrs. Brown's boys. Get rid of it. Okay, with fire. Um... What about a series then? Supposedly, then this is the end of it with number five, the Inbetweeners movie two, which they said it was the end of it when the first one came out. They said we'd never come back together just to do another movie. This is it. We'd only come back if the story was right. I don't know what story they read, but it certainly wasn't the story that ended up getting made into a film. Uh, or maybe it was. Maybe they were all just very drunk on their lots of money they've made from saying the same jokes on TV and going on Soccer AM and just ladding it up a little bit. Um, I, again, I like the Inbetweeners TV series as, as kind of coarse as it is. It worked because the joke was they were in between social classes at college, right? As soon as you take that out, they're just some weirdos in a situation it doesn't work it's same as when they did the guest house paradiso movie for bottom the bottom yeah. live shows worked the bottom tv show worked because it was one location solid with characters that we know and loved guest house paradiso was still a location with the characters didn't work and the reason is sometimes you need the constraints of the small screen you need the time constraints of what it is and the in between is 
Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Simon Pegg can't help it. Radioactive fish can't help it. And uh, God bless you, Manuel. <laughs> but that was awful. Just style vomiting as well. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was. I mean, I guess that's very so. It was rightfully ignored when everybody was outpouring their emotion for Rick Mail passing. I was quite glad that didn't get too much of a mention. Everybody was saying about how much of a genius he was, and I just think, phew, dodged a bullet with that one. No, I didn't see any channels repeating it. I didn't see a guest a re-release on DVD. I was um, I was very happy that that got scared over. And again, in between us two and Mrs. Brown's boys highlight, TV should be left on TV. Do a Christmas special for forty five minutes if you get ideas above your station, but stay out of the cinema because you're not a film. You're just people with ideas above your station, a budget that goes far beyond custard creams, and not enough invention to put twenty five minutes of film out, let alone an hour and a half. So, going into the big four, number four with Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, well, what can you say? But it's only Marvel could make a film in which you care more about an animated raccoon that can talk and a walking tree than you do the human or his <laughs> compatriots. And it's believable in the most ridiculous way. <laughs> Only Marvel could take you from a little boy losing his mum to being abducted by aliens to then flying around the galaxy, going inside a giant's head, meeting a museum owner who then uh, rocks that make people explode, ships that can link together to make a daisy chain. It's, it's bonkers, but Marvel make it work. You just believe it. You go along for the ride. James Gunn managed to bring new sci-fi, which is, I mean, for most people, Guardians of the Galaxy, they've never heard of before. So it's a completely new franchise, completely new characters, and nailed it first time. And yep. hats off for that. Absolutely. And, the, and it was the Monday movie show movie of 2014, our number one movie. So it should have been. So it should have been. Uh, number three, also Marvel, but not made by Marvel, instead made by Fox, is X Men: Days of Future Past. And I do wish Marvel had made it, because <laughs> I liked it. But I want. I wonder what would have happened if Marvel had made that storyline themselves. And even with Brian Singer still directing, but having Marvel behind it, I just would have liked to have seen it happen. Because weirdly talking about let's try and stop an alternate timeline happening why didn't they send wolverine back to stop fox that's what i'd have done never mind going back to persuade <laughs> charles xavier to be nicer it's uh it's a good film it's a solid film it's nice to see the singer films and the first class generations kind of clank together and to retroactively get rid of last stand once and for all yeah. um but there's a lot wrong with that film which is it shouldn't be it's Sentinels, it's time travel, it's every X-Men actor you've ever wanted to see in the same film. And it doesn't quite gel for me. But like I say, it's a, it's a solid film. It just should have been a lot better than it was. Um, number two is Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Yeah, brilliant. F visually brilliant. Not quite as good as Rise. For me, I preferred Rise as a story. But... I, I've, I, as a fan of film and as a fan of special effects films in particular you can't look at Caesar and not think of what a triumph that is <laughs> like, mm. we, I remember getting excited about the T-1000 walking between metal bars I remember well actually before that I remember watching Ray Harryhausen films and thinking that's a skeleton I don't understand how that's there it's having a sword fight with a man there isn't a man in it because you can see through it it must be a skeleton and every now and then there's this little jump forward and for me the apes in this do reflect the best of CGI that I've seen in a long time. Um, but I would love to see another one. I, I want them to keep making them because I like the films. But Which, as far as we're aware, they are going to. I, I, I want, do you know, I want the next one to be Planet of the Apes. That's what I want. I want, because they've set it up with the rocket launching uh, in the first one. Next, next one, I, I haven't heard anything officially, but I think the next one would have to be War for or War of the Planet of the Apes. Like the, yeah. The See, I, I, I don't. Yeah, apes. I'd I'd like that to just. I'd like that to be like you know the prequels to Star Wars before the prequels to Star Wars were made. They were always better than what they actually became. Like we imagined it so well, and I don't want the battle for Earth in the Planet of the Universe to, to not live up to my expectations. So I'd rather it just skip over that and then talk about it a little bit than do it badly because it could that could go very wrong. And uh, all, all we really want to see is a certain iconic landmark getting blown up. 
as long as that happens in a flashback that's all we need to know of that and then uh, and then go forward but yeah I, I, playing eight films I've, I've always loved um, since a kid with the originals and the TV series um, I do like the Tim Burton one I'd, I'd say that see, the thing is supposedly they haven't said that the Tim Burton one doesn't still exist and I've I, I want to see how I'd love to see them how they're going to tie everything together because I think there will come a point where mm. they go well it's in the box set isn't it as yeah, well it's in the box I have that box set and I just, yeah. it has all the films previously to Dawn of the Planet of the Apes mm. and it's in there and all inclusive so I don't think that at any point they rebooted it I think they've continued it and they've started going looking at it from different angles Yeah. and I hope they're going to now start tying it all together because I would yeah. like to see that happening I'd like I'd like to see Mark Warburg get another decent film. He's he's doing so well at the moment. He does he does Lone Survivor, exceptional. Does Transformers. Um, I'd like a new Planet X film to be his next Lone Survivor. That would be good. Well, or shoot, the gamble shoot coming out soon, which he doesn't look very good. Yeah, anymore. but I want um, him to do I want to do an effects movie again where he's good. Okay, um, so our number one DVD at the top of the chart. Believe it or not still number yeah. one after god knows how many weeks it's been it's frozen yeah well it's had another release hasn't it, it had the special the sing-along edition because yeah. people didn't know what subtitles were um but oh, and they charged three quid my, more for it it my, was mad my other half as well is responsible for buying three copies of this for people at christmas i thought you were going to say three copies for you for christmas i was going to say no. she really loves you andrew no. <laughs> No, well, she does, but yeah, she does love me. But she bought three copies for people at Christmas, so I've I've, I've like forgiven her. But it's like why? Because it's ugh, people just have bought it. I, honestly, I've got to wonder who doesn't have a copy of this now. And we have, I think, Skype interruption again. Yep, Skype is cutting off again. So if we are able to contact again, I will go into looking at our first. DVD releases, hopefully we'll get connection again. If not, okay, right, I'm gonna move on then, um, since it looks like we may have lost Nathan. Um, oh, is he back? I'm back, Hello? that was that was You're a back. weird one. I said something in praise of Frozen and the internet disconnected. <laughs> you are sounding very quiet now though. Um, All right, sorry, there we go. Yeah, uh, mm. yeah so um, no, I, I have sort of, I was just about to go into our first review this week, but as that's one you were going to cover, then uh, let's go ahead and let's see what you think of the Rover. Um, in short, really liked it. In long, let's carry on. Um, the Rover, if you skip the cinema release, which I can't blame you because it, it didn't hang around for very long. Um, and a lot of it came out at sort of a very busy time for film. But it, it comes from David Mikard, who did Animal Kingdom, which was very, very good. Uh, essentially, it's in. It's set in Australia in what some call post-apocalyptic. I wouldn't say that. Uh, it's after the economic collapse of the globe. Uh, some states and some nations have survived it, but basically Australia is the, the worst of it. Now, when I watched it, I did think that seems to be a theme for a lot of Australian films, like just kind of living on the Joe's site. And obviously the biggest comparison will always be to Mad Max when you talk about Australia on the brink. Uh, and this is mad max if mad max wasn't a kind of an action film really it's kind of you've got um oh now's the time to forget his name guy pierce yeah. playing a guy who's basically lost yeah, everything in life <laughs> no he's, he's lost everything in life all he's got left is his truck and uh which again so far so mad max and there's a, a violent gang basically that steals his truck and he goes off in dogged pursuit and it, it explores the idea of if you have lost everything how far do you go where is your restraint where's the line when you're already way over the line um, it's very very brutal at times the film doesn't always make sense uh, but sometimes that's all right but if you really think about it too much you could pull the film apart but it never lets you while you're watching it. It's one of those where you watch it and you're held and you're gripped and you feel this sense of kind of sick urgency because you, you want him to be happy, but there's no way he's ever going to be happy. Uh, along the way on his kind of road to revenge, he bumps into Robert Patterson, who is, a, is 
very, very good in this film. And I say that with a certain amount of begrudgment. I didn't want to say it. And, uh, yeah, he's basically one of the brothers of the violent gang. He's been left for dead after a botched kind of robbery attempt. And, uh, obviously, he's not dead. Guy Pierce finds him and kind of coerces him to join him on his trail of carnage. And it's a very, 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 very... Um, <sighs> If, if Robert Patterson was to die tomorrow, God forbid, but this would be the film that people would say he was a brilliant and, and talented actor who was taken too soon. He, if, you know, like, as Heath Ledger made some awful films, 10 Things I Hate About You, terrible, right? But it, before he died, he made some very, very good ones. If Robert Patterson can keep going, he did, Rory, did that one with David Cronenberg, which I'm trying to remember the name of. Uh, where he's in the limo driving around the city. Uh, yeah, which again, yeah. really, really good film and was good because of him as well as in spite of him. And that's what you get with the Rover. It doesn't hinge on him, but he was the point. He's the weak link in the chain as far as I was sitting as a viewer. I was expecting him to be awful in the role. And because he wasn't, that kind of elevated it up a little bit more than it perhaps would have done. Uh, and Australia, a, he does have a very, very odd um, language. Uh, well, dialogue in his character, the way um, accent and the way that he talks. Yeah, in this I mean, because sort of broken uh, English sort of thing. I mean, there's. Um, I'll play this clip actually because it has got him talking in it, and hmm. you can hear exactly what we're talking about with his dialogue and just how weird it is. I'll play that now. I believe in God, and I know Henry believes in God. Doesn't. And there's no harm Henry wants to see me come to. Now I believe in that. You look at the harm you've come to, and where's Henry? He's waiting for me. He's not waiting for you. Yes, he is. No, he's not. I'll tell you what God's given you. He's put a bullet in you. And he's abandoned you out here to me. He feels nothing for you. I couldn't give a f if you died tomorrow. God gave you a brother who's not waiting for you. He gave you a brother who's not even thinking about you right now. Just because you and him come out of the same woman's hole. The only thing that means anything right now is that I'm here and he's not. So, I mean, I know you're saying you enjoyed it. And the thing is, I didn't see this recently. I saw it at the cinema. I actually yeah. met one of the people that saw it in the cinema. Um, it's very quick, limited release. And I like the look of it. I wanted to see it. I was, I liked the thing because it's Guy Pearce. I'm not massively sold on Robert Pattinson. I think he's an okay actor, um, given the right things. And I've got to say, I was completely the opposite. I found it, when I saw it, it was with my other half, and friends of hers were there as well, and we all really didn't like it. There was something in it that I liked. I kind of liked the spark of it, if you get that, mm, that sort yeah. of sense of it. But I thought it was very badly... Um, I thought it was very badly brought to the screen. I thought it may have been a... It was a very basic script. didn't have a lot in it. No. Well, that's not necessarily saying that it should have had, but it didn't feel as if it was... It didn't feel as if it had enough substance to it. I found that there were moments in it where I really found it lacking, and not only lacking, but trying my patience. Mm. To a point of the, at one point, I honestly kind of was desperate for it to end because I was just waiting for I, I honestly couldn't wait for it to end soon enough. Yeah, I mean, I will say <laughs> I did, it, towards the end, I, um, I started to kind of evaluate in my head what I'd been watching. Uh, for me, I see I have, I'm a bit of a sucker for this kind of film in general. Like, I've seen worse films than this that I've still enjoyed. Um, and The Road... Uh, is one that I always find pe there's, that seems to divide people. Well, that's, that, yeah, that's one that I don't know if you've heard as well, Stuart, me talking about that. I didn't like the road. Yeah, Stuart, see, like, and I, I really like, like the road. And I think for me, that's kind of really, it had exactly the same problems that you've described. 
that Rover have. In it, there are great moments in Road where you just think, oh, what, what am I watching? What am I watching this for? And it's and it's for me that's the kind of film I wanted. And maybe because I was watching it on home media rather than in a, in a theatre as well. Sometimes that can help with a film. Yeah. Um, I think you're always a little bit more forgiving, or maybe because you're not you don't just to have to watch that. Maybe at some point when it was a bit quieter, I might have checked an email, and that's not necessarily a good thing. But it certainly <laughs> helps the film a little bit, uh, and it's why DVDs tend to do well. Uh, but yeah, I, I for me, it was the sort of film I wanted. I like that kind of miserable kind of re- violent revenge where there sort of doesn't seem to be any point to anything uh, i like that in a film so I, I enjoyed it for that but i can totally appreciate your viewpoint as well however much i disagree with you <laughs> yeah well <laughs> um i don't know if you've seen it or not but i'm gonna go on to then uh, deliver us from evil um, mm. have you seen it i was going to i had it to watch and i'm just i don't like eric banner and uh ever since he ruined the hulk and yeah. so i just thought well, you know what i don't, I don't want to see that was his fault but um <laughs> the deliver us from evil is a, a horror sort of thriller film where you have eric banner playing a police detective in new york um ends up coming upon this crime where it's um sort of a uh, three men that have been three soldiers that have been in Afghanistan have wandered into a sort of an underground um, uh, construct of some sort and come back to the United States. Um, it seems that they have come back and not come back alone and brought back something with them. Um, it is then ending up sort of resulting in these weird signs being sort of signed in places, written, drawn on walls and painted and things, which then result in other people who see them having weird sort of effects and um, essentially apparently being possessed and um, sort of caused to do crazy things. Here's a clip. Sign her out, she's off the hand well. she drugged? She's been sedated. You know this lady? Yeah, her name is Jane Crenna. You got a name? Joe Mendoza. She's one of my charges. One of your charges? What, what does that mean? I'm a Jesuit priest. Where's your collar, Padre? They work undercover, like you. You going with her? He's here at the family's request. They felt she needed a specialist. You a psychiatrist too? No, I'm not. Can you tell me exactly how she was behaving when you first saw her at the zoo? Like she was nuts. That's how. When you arrested her, did she seem unusually strong? No. Why? The reason that would interest you. But if you do think of something more specific or if I can be of any help, please call me. Okay. So Eric Banner's cop then teams up with a uh, the the priest that you heard in that clip, and it's the thing of the two of them going through this and him having his own sort of faith question. It's supposedly based on true events of the cop who then potentially he quit being a cop and then went on to sort of deal with all of these sort of supernatural things. Um, the thing I'm going to say about it is, I, as I'm well known for not liking horror, I'm, I am a wimp when it comes to horror films. I did go to see this at the cinema because uh, I agreed to. And the thing is, as much as I don't like horror films and I hate jump moments, which there are a couple of simple jump moments in this, not really, really built up ones, like in films like Mama, where you know it's coming, but mm. you have a sense that, you know, you get that sort of, it's not that everything goes quiet, but you get a sense that the camera is framed in a certain way for you to look at this point. Yeah. It's very well set up like that. Um, and I, I thought that it was quite skillfully directed. It's directed by Scott Derrickson. So it's the guy who did um, horror films that he did... Um, uh, what was it? Sinister, mm. I think, yeah. Um, uh, which I haven't seen, but I understand is one of these films that is the you know sets up a horror, sets up a jump, does a jump, sets up a jump, does a jump. Yeah. Thing again. Yeah. Um, he does that a little bit in this, but not so much. But the thing I will say is there is a lengthy exorcism scene in the film. Right. And I really found that really engrossing to watch. I loved that. I thought it was really well done. Great. It's all set in this one room, and this exorcism is going on, and it goes on, and it's like back and forth between you know them and this supposed spirit and i found that riveting i really got into that i really loved that i thought this is and it has these pyrotechnic things and everything it's expertly directed expertly put together the rest of the film not necessarily so much but for me it was around this big sort of set piece which is a, literally like a 20 minute scene in the film and 
for me, I'm saying if you like that sort of thing, if you like to see something that's expertly pulled off, it's worth it for seeing it for that 20 minutes. Mm. It's it's a nicely done piece of cinema that honestly surprised me and how much I enjoyed it more than I was either A, expecting to, or B, ever really wanting to because of the subject and the, the horror f- aspect of it. So, yeah. I mean, it's it's a film that I would say, if you like horror, have a look at it. It may not be right up your alley. It is, it is more horror and thriller than just horror, just outright horror. But the thing about it that's surprising is that even someone who doesn't like horror, I enjoyed it. That's good. That's very good. Yeah. I, I, think, I mean, that's that's only a good thing if it's, if it's a horror film and I liked it I mean I have I do like some I mean things like The Thing you know yeah. classic films like I like them I like them but I don't like cheap horror and that's no. what a lot of horror has now become yeah I think if I remember rightly the director also or at least the executive producers of um, Deliverers and Evil also worked on Exorcism of Emily Rose which is one of my favourites and that would make sense if they're involved for uh, it to have another great exorcism scene because that was a phenomenal movie. And uh, yeah, I'd, um, I would love to check this out despite having Eric Banner in it. And uh, I can recommend bad. it. Oh, it's actually not bad, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it's still Eric Banner, though. So um, potentially this might be this might get me a slap somehow, but potentially talking of cheap onto Nurse or The Nurse in 3D. Yeah. 3D. Yeah, uh, yeah it's... Um, Paz de la Huerta as the titular nurse who um uh, right before we even go into it this is a grindhouse homage right this is made in that deliberately cheap nasty kind of way and being in 3D was just part of that what they wanted to do was go hey this will be cool and we'll stick this to your face and we'll do this near your face so from the, the outset it was never intended to be a straight up serious movie so when I read obviously what it's about It'll make more sense. So she's a nurse in a crack team of nurses <laughs> at All Saints Memorial Hospital. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of the Fox, the Fox Force 5 thing from Pulp Fiction. So. Very similar. But again, <laughs> this is how these films go. This is all fine and well. And she basically, she's very dedicated. She's very good. Kathleen Turner is her boss. It's all a nice little world in which nurses are good at the same time as a serial killer on the loose and uh, it may be that um well it is i mean <laughs> they advertise it as such that she's basically killing uh, unfaithful men so it sits in the strain of um i spit on your grave and, and films like that as well it's like an episode of criminal minds at the moment it's yeah i mean it, it is unashamedly sexploitation it is silly and over the top and gory and it's basically she becomes obsessed with this woman and then tries to sort of kill people around this woman to bring themselves closer together and she's twisted and it all goes all wrong for her Um, but in no way can I criticise it because when you set out to make a Grindhouse style film straight away you're kind of saying look we know this isn't going to be great Um, Hansa (laughs) we're not trying to be and when a film's not trying to be great, you, you kind of then feel like, oh, well, yeah, you've, you've achieved what you've tried to aim for. So that's that's a good thing. Obviously, things like Machete Kills, that's not good. <laughs> that's not good at all. But the first Machete and Hobo of a Shotgun and oh, films no. like it. Don't start on that. But they, but they do, the, they make the film they set out to make. And whether you like it or not is irrelevant because the film never wanted to. They're essentially big budget trauma movies. And uh, and I, I like that about it. I liked the kind of the honesty of it. Really, is it? It was just kind of saying, yeah, let's put in these really kind of cheesy lines of dialogue. Let's put in these very obvious kind of scare scenes, and we'll have this bloody bone saw and we'll hold it right in front of the camera in 3D, and it will just, you know, how with a 3D film sometimes it's just so painfully obvious that what's going to happen next in 3D. Yeah. There's loads of that. But I watched it in 2D, so it's just then annoying because you think, oh, stop pointing things at me and get on with the storyline. I've not got any special glasses or TV or Blu-ray. Just just show me the film. Um, it, it isn't great. It's, it's in no way great. But for a sort of film where you sit back and think, I just want to watch something stupid, it's, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. If you're listening and you're a woman who sometimes fantasizes about killing men in bars, this is brilliant. <laughs> And if you're the sort of person who listens uh, and you really like kind of 
kind of nursery fantasy things. Also brilliant. I mean, it does. It ticks all the boxes. It's just, it's not a great film, but it was never meant to be. And I can't criticize it for being a bad film when they set out to make a bad film. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it is what it is. It's a uh, special super. Weirdly though, she's very unattractive. That's the bit I don't understand that every other nurse in the, in the kind of crack team, reasonably attractive and she's supposed to be this big kind of femme fatale who will lure men in and a murder them and you just look at it and you think not that I'm judgmental on somebody's kind of appearance but she's a well known kind of artist actress and so her being in the film is kind of that's the big point um, but I did find that that was the most unbelievable thing Kathleen Turner would have been more believable in the role especially after I've seen um, the fact that she's already killed Roger Rabbit so uh, it's what can you do? But uh, yeah, it's 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 an all right film. It's uh, there's nothing more you say. It's just one of those films where it exists. It is a thing. It exists, okay. One way or another. If you're not ever going to be interested, I mean, the case for it is very clear about what it is. If you're not interested, you're not going to touch it. If you are interested, you won't be disappointed. Yeah, I think I'm in the former category there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is the thing. Um, you, you wouldn't deliberately watch a film that you know you're not going to like, would you? No. Well, oh, I do, but well, you, <laughs> sometimes well, you have true. to, I sometimes, suppose. Well, yeah, sometimes you, you see a film and you think, this is going to be absolutely terrible, it's going to be rubbish. And because you have those lowered expectations, yeah. you then find that you enjoy it because you go in thinking it's going to be utter, utter tripe. And then you see it and you go, oh, you know what? It wasn't utter tripe. It was one level above utter tripe, but I was surprised at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do like to go into a film with low expectations. <laughs> yeah. I did that with Alien vs. Predator 2, though. Well, but you weren't disappointed. That's the way you can never be disappointed yeah, if you've got no expectations. You, could, you weren't surprised. I so should have been. Um, okay, I'm going to go on to Life of Crime, which is um, based on the Elmer Leonard book, The Switch. Um, has this uh, central characters of you have a married couple played by Jennifer Aniston and Tim Robbins, um, both of whom are having sort of affairs on the side. Uh, things their marriage don't seem to be going sort of fine until you find out uh, when Tim Robbins is um, off um, seeing his uh, his uh, well his bit on the side, basically played by Arthur Fisher, um, and he's actually filed for divorce. Um, into the story come along uh, a couple of um, kidnappers played by Mosdef and John Hawks who kidnap uh, Jennifer Aniston's character hold her for ransom and set a ransom of one million dollars which they know Tim Robbins' character has in a bank account the only thing is he doesn't really kind of feel like paying it here's a clip oh, this is unbelievable. yeah I know it's a little strange You watch the news? Yes. There was nothing about you on the 7.30 or the 8 o'clock. What do you think? What are you asking me for? You got something going with that guy? He's a friend of the family. Well, he must be the godfather, bringing your martinis to your bedroom while your husband's away. How come he didn't call the police? I don't know. He could be dead. Or in a coma, you hit him with something, right? We checked. He let himself out. So now we waiting on 11 o'clock news. What we mean is we don't know Marshall or what he's got to lose, but is he the kind of guy who'd stick his neck out for you? <laughs> Honestly, Guys, I don't, I don't know. So here's the thing with Life of Crime, and bearing in mind that it's based on an Elmore Leonard novel, there are lots of other films out there based on Elmore Leonard ones. Get Shorty, which is a fantastic one. Um, you have the follow-up to that, which was uh, Be Cool, which wasn't quite so good, um, but was still okay. Had its moments in it, which genuinely did make you laugh. Um, things like Out of Sight, which isn't one of my favourite films, but is a good sort of Elmore Leonard thing. And then you've got other Elmore Leonard things adapted for television as well. Um, this was released earlier in last year. It was released in America in cinema in a very small release and straight on video on demand. It was released on video on demand here only. I don't think it even got a cinema release. If it did, it was very, very limited. And I can see why. Because the thing is, Elmore Leonard writes stuff that can be very dry, very comedic, but still serious. 
the problem with this is it just doesn't have that dry balance it doesn't have anything in it funny at all it, it tries to be funny but there's no point in it does it actually make you laugh and even even very dryly or very darkly it's it's basically it feels like a tv movie and that's the thing that jennifer aniston being cast in it doesn't help either because her her be, her appearance in films for me don't work a lot of the time the only thing i've seen her in most things i mean the last thing i saw her in was we're the millers and she felt like the odd one out in that in the cast she didn't feel like i, I didn't buy her in it no um and the thing is i mean it's got this cast of um jennifer aniston moss def uh tim robbins um you've got in there uh Arthur fisher and it should be funny it should and you can see it's trying to be funny it's just not funny it doesn't pull it off it, it's really just it, it's too wound too tightly that it needs to be it doesn't it doesn't seem to be like there's any any looseness to it any chance for it to get a rhythm it, it just basically goes from a to b to c to d to e and by the time you get to the end of it you're just going well you know why why am i watched this why am i getting i'm not getting into it why am i sitting here watching it i honestly could not wait for it and talking about that happening with the rover but with this it was just the case of the there was nothing in it that i found really interesting at all i didn't care about any of the characters i didn't care about anything that they did i didn't care about anything that was going to happen to any of them i i especially didn't care for the character played by jennifer aniston who's the one that's supposed to be in peril and stuff and that's a big problem you need to have connection with your audience and if you don't have that you don't have anything no no it, it's it's a really shame as well because i mean i love tim robbins tim robbins in serious almost satirical mode would be brilliant in this, it just it honestly just feels like he's just reading the lines. And is I don't it, is, think that's is, I don't think that's down to him. I think that's down to the script and the direction. Yeah, is it better than Nothing to Lose with Martin Lawrence? No, because I because I, I love, love that Nothing film. To, I love Nothing to Lose. That, that is out and out comedy. This is just this is trying to be a drama, but have comedy yeah. it and have dry, subtle humor, and it doesn't know how to do subtle humor. It doesn't know how to do dry humor. No. It doesn't try and do anything slapstick. Thankfully, if it did that, it would even be worse. Mm. So it would be trying to do the lowest common denominator humour, which I'm glad it doesn't. But it it just doesn't have anything there that gives it that spark, and I mean that's why I can see that it didn't get a big release because it it just yeah. people would have gone through it and just gone bad word of mouth would have killed it straight away. Yeah, it amazes me that people still think that Jennifer Aniston is a bank of actress in a film. I've as you were saying, you know, she always seems to be completely out of place. I loved We're the Millers, but nothing to do with her. She, um, I didn't buy her character in that. I mean, the only no. thing is with Jennifer Aniston. Every time I've seen her, I find that she's the weak link in, it, in it, whatever yeah. it's watching. And the same for most Friends actors, really. It's, they've mm. just never seemed to kind of get out of that role. But maybe because they were just so. Whenever you look at Jennifer Aniston, you see Rachel. Um, she needs to do something. Like that. I mean, she did. The, was it the Good Wife? I think she did. Um, and where she was a kind of dowdy woman working in a supermarket that was all right because it was totally against the normal cast that she would have um uh, but I'd generally love to see her playing like a i don't know a killer or something a serial killer put her in yeah something have her playing something that's evil not i mean the other thing i've seen obviously just thinking about horrible bosses and horrible bosses 2 recently was oh dear lord well, well she was a killer in them because she murdered the plot mm, yeah but ugh. But just, uh, it's just a horrible, awful thing which I kind of wish I could forget now. But, yeah, always uh, away. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> yeah, let's move on to the best film of the year, shall yes. we? Yes. Um, um, I'm looking forward to seeing what you think of this. So, yeah, so let's build up to it. It's a Nicolas Cage movie in which he's in an aeroplane and it's the end of the world as we know it. And he feels fine. Um, it's left behind. Keep, the, you keep this up, we will get sued for like using lyrics. We'll, we'll get, we'll get uh, like a bill. If you for, point it out, then they're going to know I've done it. I was being very <laughs> careful and, and subtle there, and you just highlighted it now. I'm going to have Michael Stipe come around and kick me in the knees. Um, okay, so for anyone who doesn't know, Left Behind picks up the idea that the rapture which for anyone who doesn't ever go to Bible studies is basically the day on which all who are good and holy will be whipped up to heaven 
very, very quickly in the blink of an eye, I think is specifically written. Uh, and everyone else who has sinned or doesn't believe in God will be left on earth to basically suffer while Jesus and the Antichrist battle it out in the end of days. Now, that sure sounds like a brilliant film. And it was all right when they did it in This Is The End. And uh, another film that did it, which I thought was very good, was Red State, although it was kind of turned it on its head a little bit. Yeah. This one is based on a series of books uh, which are about the rapture and living on Earth after the rapture has occurred, which, again, on paper, sounds very good. The problem is it takes itself far, far too seriously and yet doesn't seem to take anything seriously enough either. You've got the most overacting I have ever seen Nicolas Cage do. And that really ranks as a something special. This is the man who goes, my God, not the bees. And we were supposed to believe him. In this one, he takes his wedding ring off in a scene and then explains later, I always take my wedding ring off before I fly a plane. Do you, robotic Nicolas Cage? Well, that is very interesting how about we hear more from your daughter who seems to conveniently spout um expedition exposition about the plot without anybody standing there just going this is exactly as my mother said it would happen in the bible while i was talking about these things with nobody in particular let's go to a hospital which is open to the public and i'll smash a window and climb in and walk around the back door that's that doesn't make any sense then go into a room full of empty cribs and then the only one person in that room stands behind a curtain, waits for it to turn around, and it flicks the curtain out of the way and goes, they've all gone. Well, we know they've all gone. We've got eyes. We can see they've all gone. The room's empty. Um, you know, in a world in which suddenly all of the children, among adults, but every child on the planet basically has disappeared, what happens is, within two minutes, people start looting the supermarkets. They're not worried that suddenly they've witnessed the mass exodus of life on Earth as itself. They just want to get themselves a 42-inch plasma and get home with it. And they're fighting over it in the street like it's a Black Friday sale. Um, in the car park, near an airport, one plane crashes. One small microlight lands in the car park and hits one car. Now, this is directed by... Vic Armstrong, who, if you don't know, is a very, very famous second unit director and stuntman. And there isn't a decent stunt in the entire film. And that's wrong. It would be like me being a baker and then going to someone's house and then going, oh, the baker's coming around. I wonder what he's going to make for us. He might make a lovely cut pie or maybe some cake. And then I just draw a picture of a house on a blackboard with some chalk and then go, look, was that what you're expecting? No, it's not. You've got Leah Thompson off of Back to the Future, and it looks like she's basically made of wood. Uh, she has one amazing scene <laughs> in it where a daughter and her have an argument. A daughter runs off in a strop, and she literally just goes, don't go. That's it. That's it. The last time she sees anybody, her family, ever again, and the next time you see her, she's just staring through a window like the woman in white. It's, it's just absolutely weird now while all of this is going on Nicolas Cage is in an aeroplane with the woman that he's supposed to be cheating on his wife with taking her to a U2 concert when they land in London oh, that's fair enough all the pa passengers on a plane pre-rapture you can sort of look around and you kind of know which ones aren't going to be going to the rapture and the reason is the film has for want of a better word massive great big flashing yellow arrows <laughs> that point at people for example there's a dwarf now, I'm not saying dwarves are evil. We've seen films where that has been the case, but I've also seen Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and they were quite kindly. So we can't automatically assume that dwarves wouldn't be taken up during the rapture. This dwarf, however, was going to place a bet on an American football game, and that's a sin. And the film will point it out by having him write in big letters the odds of what the race is, of the matches, even though he hasn't got the odds from anywhere. He's just written them down. And the man next to him goes, so you're a gambler? Well, yes, he's a gambler, because you've just told us he's a gambler. As he, and the drug addict tells us she's a drug addict. And the cheating man is there with the woman he's cheating with. Every person comes up with a very specific sin and just explains it. Not as part of character development, just as, well, you might wonder why they didn't go. Well, yeah. 
Well, at the end of the film, suddenly there's an extra two thirds of a plane with passengers that we never saw. They just appeared from the hold or something, like Somalian refugees. I've, I've no idea where they suddenly appeared from. It it should have been a really interesting biblical. Now we were talking about Exodus, Gods and Kings earlier. A good Bible story can be done really, really well. And the idea that everyone's taken from Earth and the people who are left behind could have been explored in a very interesting way. Instead, it becomes Airport 77, <laughs> only without any of the threat and CGI effects that wouldn't have gone amiss in Mega Shark vs. Giant Octopus. Um, they also the got the whole thing of the, the daughter clearing a runway with a, with a truck. Big, with a big truck, a big steamrolling truck. It's like something out of Well, no, she, only, she has to move that. Yeah, yeah, it's like the, something the out of the past the steamroller. It's like, I was it, honestly watching it and thinking... I've been on a steamroller, yeah. <laughs> and they move quicker than that. In the film, it moves at about half a mile an hour, um, just for dramatic things. And then you don't see it again. They don't even bring that back up again. <laughs> it's just, it was there one minute. She's going, oh my God, go. I thought she was going to be like, the, the plane was going to land. Because basically, it, for, it doesn't matter, we're not spoiling anything. The plane needs to land and there's no <laughs> runway. So she's basically found a stretch of run of motorway that's being built. But she decides that the plane won't be able to move the traffic cones. So she decides to ram all the traffic cones out of the way with a truck. And then notices there's a steamroller in the way. So very slowly drives a steamroller forward, which is a far further journey than just going backwards three feet, which would have been enough. Also, the fact that actually a plane's wings are higher than a steamroller would have been anyway. So unless it was directly in the middle, wouldn't <laughs> A bit of problem. Um, then manages to crash a truck into the only obstacle on the area it, on a flat, it, yeah. uh, on a very flat piece of motorway up ramp. Suddenly, there's a big patch of dirt just there, and she didn't notice it until she's driven right up it and then stuck. An airplane's coming into land <laughs> that might explode. She doesn't get out of the truck. She sits in it and waits to see what happens and tells her dad to hopefully lift the wing up on his satellite phone so that he doesn't hit her. And then we've got fire and explosions running alongside the motorway that sets off a big tower of a ball of fire and ends a big propane tank at the end of the makeshift runway, but that never actually catches fire. And the plane seems to be on fire, even though there was no fire on the plane. It fills with smoke, which doesn't make any sense either. <laughs> yeah, and so then, it's that thing of as soon as they landed conveniently, then there's smoke. So yeah. everyone needs to get out quick. And everybody needs to get out quick. And Nicholas Cage decides to just walk up and down the plane for a couple of minutes. And then they all stand next to the plane <laughs> and celebrate the fact they haven't died while everything else is exploding around them. Let's just sit here. And, uh, and then the film ends with a shot that looks a bit like the end of Die Hard 2 only without any of the excitement or flashing lights of Die Hard 2. While she's driving to find the runway, she manages to find a motorcycle that was obviously dropped in the Rapture, which was about 14 hours prior, and the light's been on all day, but it, the Rapture was daytime, so he shouldn't have had his lights on, <laughs> and it hasn't drained the battery at all, and she's able to just stand it off and ride it off. And there are lots of cars just casually driving around. No panic. They're just off. Obviously, they couldn't close the streets for the film, but you just get these cars drive past in the background and you just think, it's not really the end of the world if everybody's now calmed down. They've, they've looted all the stores. They've now settled down. It just, on every level, it's a terrible, terrible, awful movie. And yet, the reason I found it most annoying was, as an atheist, I find some very Christian movies to be a bit confusing. But the idea of the rapture is the one question that, as an atheist, we should be asking ourselves as much as a Christian would ask themselves. What if it happened and it was true? After all, as, and all the atheists of the world were wrong. That's a terrifying prospect. Like, for me, if you're going to talk about some existential crisis, that's the one right there, is what if the Christians are right? Because it's, it's, it's as likely... In a, in a fantastical setting that it could go one way or the other and I wanted that to be explored I wanted it to be you know if, is, it, is it possible to atone for your sins and still go which they, they did that in This Is The End in a very hilarious way um, but with, with this saving it's, for the sequel 
<laughs> well, this, I mean, there is, there is, I think, five books. The fourth book, or, or the fourth TV movie, because there was TV movies. I've done all sorts of research into this film, given it far too much time. The fourth movie <laughs> adaptation had Mr. T in it. Now, we all know he's a Christian because he's got a massive cross on his chest, but he didn't ascend. Why is that? Why is that? It's, oh, it's just, it's hilarious. The, the dwarf actor in the film is terrible. Just, I, I don't know whether he's a terrible actor or he was being told to do these weird, I've, I've seen him, confusing I can't his things. Name is, but I've seen him in other things before and he's not a terrible actor. He's just no. doing this. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, but this is the thing, like, uh, they're delivering lines as if they're, they're chewing on a hive full of bees. <laughs> And he's like, here's this possibility. And there's a, the only sensible person is a drug addict. And she only explains what's happening after saying, I know what's happening. And then locks herself in a separate room, takes a load of drugs, comes out, and then everybody sorts of believes her. But the guy who suggested it might be UFOs was told that he was crazy. Someone suggests that maybe the people are just invisible, which means that they're then going around just poking thin air just to see if it actually people have gone invisible. It's just insane. This, this film makes absolutely no sense. It's an incredible waste of time. And the worst thing is they're planning another two sequels, which hopefully it's lost about 40 million, I think, already. If it doesn't do well on DVD, which I'm worried the Bible Belt of America will buy this en masse and it will make it profitable. Um, it's just, just so, so miserable and depressing and rubbish. And all the way through, all it reminded me of was a Stephen King kind of sci-fi horror called The Langoliers. Have you ever seen that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that is a very similar premise, really. People on a plane wake up and everybody around them has disappeared and all their belongings are on the chairs, which is pretty which exactly what would happen if it was a rapture scenario. And that managed to make that really exciting and really dramatic on a TV movie budget with pretty much no name actors. And, um, uh, and then it turns out to be dimensions and time travel and everything else. And it's exciting. They did have David this, Morse in it as well. Though. Yes. David Morse is a great actor. And it looks like Skype is playing up again. Oh, no! Nope. Oh, you're back. I'm back. Okay. So, um, I think, yeah, I think so... we're being. I think we're being told to wrap it up on. Um, <laughs> it's 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 the rapture is happening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'll just leave it on one note. The most interesting point of the entire film is she goes to a church. The daughter goes to a church. And in the church, there are no clothes whatsoever on any of the seats, which suggests that at the time of the rapture, nobody was actually praying. And the only person in there is the pastor. And she says, you know, how is it that you have not ascended and everybody else has? And he said, it's not enough to say the word. You've got to believe it. And in that, that one little nugget, that's where a film could have been brilliant. If they explored that, like the torture of what it is to be a man of God, but without being a man of God. And she just basically goes off for a walk, <laughs> decides to commit suicide. <laughs> and uh, it, oh, it's, it's just a silly, silly film that doesn't deserve to have a release on DVD. I, as you're saying, it went straight, it skipped a UK cinema release. Frankly, we were lucky on that one. There's another Rapture film coming out, or has been at the remaining. I don't know if that's come out yet. I'm not sure. There was, was a TV series, I think, that did it better from the looks of it. I haven't seen it, but it was one where people were there and all of a sudden they were gone. I, can't, I think it's like The Leftovers or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which looked like it was a better thing, probably based on the same things or something, but obviously based around the rapture and stuff. So that supposedly does a better job. So I think maybe that's the one if that people should be to looking at. Yeah. I mean, people, people should watch it. They should definitely watch it just to see, just to remind just themselves of what, happens, what happens when Nicolas Cage isn't allowed to act properly. Because because I've seen Joe. Joe was really good. Um, I've seen so many films where even in a in a film which is ridiculous, like Con Air, for example, is ridiculous. The Rock is ridiculous, but it's okay because the film works. This could have worked. Mm. This should have worked. It should have been a hell on earth scenario, not people fighting over a TV outside Halfords. It just doesn't it's just silly and it's stupid and it doesn't ever fulfill anything it promises and frankly that is the hell that we've been left with the, you know, there is a rapture and it's people who haven't had to watch this film <laughs> right <laughs> so I'm pretty much sure that won't be your TV movie uh, your movie of the week sorry um, before, uh, before we go on to movie of the week 
let's have a look at uh, some TV movies of the week. Have you got you've got a sol- suggestion there, haven't you, for I've, something on this week? I've got. Um, yeah, well, you know what? It's, it would be very easy to come out and say something that's quite a big film or a British film. What I'd like to point people towards uh, is an after, it's on in the afternoon this week on uh, Film 4, and it's the Million Pound Note from 1954 uh, with Gregory Peck. Uh, not a film many people have seen. It's one of those that tends to get shown on Channel 4 and Film 4 in the afternoons where it's these old kind of, like the old Ealing comedies and things. And it's essentially the story of a penniless sailor who bumps into two rich people who give him a million pound banknote at the turn of the 1900s. Now, their point is having the money would mean that either would that million pound be worth something just as a banknote or would he have to spend it? And of course, he goes into a shop and tries to buy something. There's no way you couldn't give the change. <laughs> um, and so it brings up this kind of question where they're arguing about what would happen to him morally and how would people react to somebody who was carrying a, a million pounds and it's and it's a really interesting film i mean it's it's a silly concept and it's something that's kind of te- uh, dealt with um with brewster's millions and films like that later on in the 80s they did this kind of thing again with rich people kind of meddling and trading places as well uh, similar kind of setup but gregory peck plays the kind of cleanest cut most morally <laughs> perfect guy in the world and he does nothing wrong with the the, the, the kind of the power that he's got and it's a, a very interesting film I recently bought it for my children to watch uh, one Sunday afternoon on DVD and uh, they watched it and they sat and they watched the entire film from start to finish and uh, if anybody hasn't seen it I urge you to do so or, or set your, your PVRs to grab it if you're at work because it's in the afternoon but it's definitely worth a, a, a look when's that, when's that again? I, I think Wednesday afternoon uh, so Wednesday the 9th or whatever it is Wednesday this week Wednesday, week on the, the 7th yeah um, yeah. so that's odd because mine, I've got ones on the 7th as well for this for that night um, there's a double bill on film 4 from starting at 9 o'clock The Guard and 10.55 in Bruges which uh, <laughs> Brendan Gleeson double bill which is a great double bill because he's just so Brendan Gleeson can be hysterically funny when he wants to be and in mm. The Guard especially he is so yeah politically incorrectly funny yeah especially with him and the the matching up with him and don don cheadle yeah and the two of them as um him as a member of the garda the irish police force and um don cheadle as an fbi agent that comes into there and the two of them having to team up this is like you're saying about the the buddy cop thing this is not like an 80s buddy cop thing but no. it is a bizarre present day buddy cop thing that's just it's it's so warped but so funny and yet at the time at the same time without being offensive so offensive mm. so it's definitely a great one and then obviously i mean in bruges is the the one that's uh, he was in with um colin firth uh, colin firth colin farrell yeah um and that was the one that started off the film i can't remember the director's name but who then all went on to do seven psychopaths so it's a it's a great starting point. I, I'm not a massive fan of it, but I do admit that it has qualities to it that are, are worth checking out if you haven't seen it. Yeah, and um, and it's also if you see them and you like them, do check out Calvary as well because Calvary yes. is phenomenal. Calvary is very good. I didn't like the ending of Calvary, but no. not for that. Not for the what happens, but for the just the way it was done. But yeah, it's, it's still worth. People need to see it. That's because yeah. it's films like that don't get seen the guard is one that we've stocked since we opened because uh, i've wanted it in there and uh, it's it's constantly going out to people so yeah highly recommended from this side as well i nearly picked those but i thought i'd not be obvious <laughs> no. oh thank you <laughs> so um what would be your option then if it's not left behind for movie of the week oh, well i don't know i'm going to say nurse because it's it's exactly what it sets out to be and that's fine okay. i i, I want to i so want to say birdman because i did really like it but i've got to say theory of everything because it was just so much more i connected with it more as yeah. much as birdman is a fantastic film and i i don't i, I kind of don't want to say you know what i'm going to say double bill my my movies of the week theory of everything and birdman i'm going to cheat because because Stuart's really not say, here to tell you off. <laughs> no, he's not. He, 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 I'd say it anyway. He could just tell me off. Damn him. 
Damn him, screw him. His, his, he was on following the nerd last week. I actually was going to get a clip of it and play it back to him because at one point he's listened to him. What about me on the show? About Andrew on the show? And he said, oh, screw him. So I was <laughs> like, yeah, screw him this time. Screw Stuart, yeah. Um, no, I think, yeah, it depends on what you want to see. If you want to see either of them, though, definitely see Theory of Everything and Birdman because they are both brilliant. Excellent. Um, so that, that's it for this week's show. Um, thank you to you, Nathan, for joining me and, oh, and filling awesome. in for me. It's been a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Um, for those who don't know, where can they find you online? Hello? Is Skype playing around again? Or is he just going quiet? Oh. No, it's, it's, you're back. <laughs> Every time I, I find. Yeah. Every time I, I get enthusiastic saying, about something. <laughs> They're saying, for those who don't know you online, where can they find you? Please don't uh, wake up this time. No, well, the easiest place to find me is on Twitter. I'm on there quite a bit. Uh, you find me there at Bouncy Ball with an H after the second B. Uh, I'm also now just about to launch a new video video games podcast uh, via my Lollacost website, uh, which is uh, with Lollacost back in the game. And that should be starting this week, next week. We're recording the first episode tomorrow night, so depending on how quick I can edit them. Which, <laughs> how quick I can be bothered to edit them and uh, how easily they are to edit because sometimes the edit can be a chore even if you've enjoyed the recording um, they will be going out there basically if you've ever listened to a video game podcast then you know what to expect we'll also be talking bits about films and books and comics and stuff as well if relevant but generally it will be video game podcast with my own sense of humour and I'm doing that with a friend of mine uh, Rob McGregor and uh, it sh- should <laughs> should be uh, the, the next big thing as obviously everybody should pretend to be when they launch a new podcast but we would just be quite happy if people listen to it and like it so yeah if you want to check out either Lollacost or Ransible that's where you'll find me or just, just message the Monday Movie Show directly and just say how much you love me and you'd like me more often and I might come back yeah which you can do at Monday Movie Show at yahoo.com um, as I said earlier, also you can check out the Monday Movie Show UK website, um, and also find us on Facebook dot com forward slash Monday Movie Show. Um, you can also find us on Twitter at Monday Movie Show, and I'm on there at AHDVD. Stuart will hopefully, fingers crossed, be back next week. Next week we may be on Sunday. That's still being worked out, but check out the website for the update as soon as we do know. We will put that up on there. Um, you can also find us um, on. We are finally, as we said last episode we are back on itunes now after a long way away from there and problems with that we're now back up on there i believe you're on there as well aren't you with we are lollacost uh yes yeah you can find it on there um if you type in lollacost make sure you type the full word otherwise you get some very weird results <laughs> okay. um and also going to give a quick shout out to following the nerd as well following the nerd.com which is a site that we do sort of um, deal with as well and they put us on there as soon as we're done so um that's it for this week's show thank you for joining us live or thank you for listening to us on the download afterwards um, we're going to leave you with a clip as we normally do this time the clip is of a film coming up next week with Foxcatcher um, another based on the true story thing of to do with the Olympics and a, a wrestling training of a character um, with the character played by uh, Channing Tatum being trained by a in a, in a career defining performance um, a performance by Steve Carell who looks nothing like he normally does if you've seen the trailer then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about if not just listen to this clip and just see how sort of odd and subdued he sounds but until next week bye 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 do you have any idea why I asked you to come here today no no well Mark do you have, do you have any idea who I am no some rich guy calls you on the phone. I want Mark Schultz to come visit me. Well, I'm a, I'm a wrestling coach. And I have a deep love. The sport of wrestling. And I wanted to speak with you about your future. About what you hope to achieve. What do you hope to achieve, Mark? I don't want to 
be the best in the world. I want to go to Worlds and win gold. I want to go to the 88 Olympics in Seoul. Win gold. Good. I'm proud of you.